Hi, everybody. Today is a very special day in Skeleton Crew history for a couple of reasons. One, this video will be coming out on our one year anniversary of releasing our first video in 2022. So this is our big anniversary video. We wanted to celebrate with something a little more inspired than Chasmosaurus. So we've decided to give ourselves a treat and talk about the worst design in this game. Um, everybody has been waiting for this for a long time. We are thrilled we get the chance to do it, but we're doubly thrilled because as of recording this episode a couple of there's, minutes ago... There's, there's one person who's not going to get to see this episode. Right. So yeah, Henry Kissinger died. A great evil has been released from the world. And to celebrate that fact, we're going to bring another great evil of equal magnitude into the world. Um, oh, Dalton, could Jesus. you please release... <laughs> Well, we, who are we? The Deinonychus. I don't who care are who we? we are, Scott. I don't care. I want to see the evil. I'll introduce myself later at some random point in the video. Nobody will know when. Look out. Release the evil. You see? Gross. Yuck. Isn't it disgusting? Everyone, boo this man. Boo. 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 I'm Dalton Bravo. Meyer. I'm a PhD fan of the Yale University. <laughs> <laughs> but we ain't even there yet. Uh, we... Uh, We're doing you know, a hodgepodge. We're doing a hodgepodge. Oh my god. Is I... this a large concrete pit? This is a large concrete pit. <laughs> it's a bit of shame. Welcome to the hole. Welcome to the hole. <laughs> this is where they belong. <laughs> Featuring Deinonychus. It's descending into hell to meet his good friend Henry Kissinger. I, I only wish that the pit of concrete could have fire at the bottom. Oh, we could emulate the, the, no, the no eternal fire. habitat of Henry Kissinger. Right, <laughs> exactly. Um, the Cloverleaf Formation? <laughs> sure. What? Well, you know, listen, when I was in the Cloverleaf Formation, I was actually, I was there in my first ever field experience, um, which was the, like, volunteer thing that I was able to do with my dad. So he and I were there. And there were a lot of, like, the Cloverleaf rock is very popcorny, and it yeah. tends to get these big cavities in it. And there was one where I swore, like, it was just pitch dark. It was this big pipe that a man could fit down, and it went deep, deep into the earth. And I do suspect that's where Henry Kissinger died. <laughs> I think that was his home in Connecticut that I heard he died peacefully at tonight. Oof. Anyway, we're gonna, we'll stop the Henry Kissinger jokes at some point, but um, I, before we stop them, I'm going to do two things. One is remind you that I'm Dr. James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral research scholar at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. I will also say um, that us making fun of Henry Kissinger is not to make light of the many evil things that he did, but because we think uh, it is good that such an evil presence is no longer on Earth. And we think that the one thing he would have hated more than everybody hating him was people making fun of him. And that's what we've got. To, that's what we can do. So, We're and it's what everybody part. is currently doing. My Twitter timeline has not been this wild in years. <laughs> it, it, this is like, I mean, it's a different kind of wild, but it's the kind of wild it was after Dune came out and film Twitter liked it. And, and it was constant, constant fun shenanigans. Twitter's, Twitter's wild in right now. Anyway, that's the last Henry Kissinger joke for like five minutes. Until we think of a funny new one. Right. Anyway, Amelia, anyway. It's your are, we, turn. Are, we, are, are we actually doing introductions? I didn't know if we wanted to scatter them. You can or you can't. It, it no, I don't want to. I want to get it over. I, I do not. Um, I do not feel. I feel nothing, but rage. Um. Anyway, my name is Amelia Zitlow. I'm a PhD student, PhD candidate. I'm not gonna. We're not gonna make that mistake. Um, <laughs> at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. God forbid I have to become a candidate again. <laughs> Just sliding back down the concrete pit. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Johnston. And ever since the beginning of this channel, I have had this creature's face taped on one of those big boxing uh, punching bags. And I have been training against it every single day since the formation of this channel. This is the culmination of our work, and I cannot wait to tear this thing apart. Uh, no, to beat this thing to death with my bare hands like 
uh, like, I, like, like, an, like Anthony Bourdain said he wanted to do the Ke- Henry Kissinger film. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> he got there eventually, got Scott. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. You're just going to wring its little turkey neck? <laughs> just, just... To grab it by the fin on its head and throw it against that concrete wall. As it giggles in the background and mocks me. The sounds are so bad. It's Everything so about gross. it sucks. It's not a good one. Folks, it's not a good one. It's uh, bad. Is one. That the, uh, did you finish your introduction, Scott? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm Alex Rubenstall, a uh, PhD candidate at Yale University. And, you know... Uh, what rough beast? It's our come at last. Slouches toward Bethlehem at this hour. It's it's Deinonychus. It's bad. <laughs> and together, together we're also Dalton. we're the skeleton crew. Uh, oh yeah, yeah he did himself. Wow. Earlier. I introduced myself yeah. earlier. I yeah. took initiative. Did, did. We're the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton crew. We are the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton crew. <laughs> so anyway, oh god. Um. Why do we hate this design so much? It's bad. It stinks. It, it's, it's almost terrible. It's, it's bad in a way personally offensive. Yeah, it's it's bad in a way that transcends like just a bad or ugly design. It's 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 one of the few designs in the game that is offensive. It it really is like I wouldn't be surprised if I found out that the designer uh, the, the character designer for the Deinonychus in this game, like, their entire family got killed by a Deinonychus or something like that, and right. they were tasked Wait. by making of making it and putting it in this game. Let's leave the pit and discuss Deinonychus proper. Okay. In Put- something approaching its natural habitat. Yeah. Oh, God. Well, so it's I, it's I, in I, a gross floodplain swamp, which is appropriate. Yes, this looks like a salamandrous type of animal. Um, I think it's worth maybe bringing up a little bit about why we think this design is so bad. Because, like, listen, I think it's aesthetically kind of ugly, right? Like, it, it's just mm-hmm. the body proportions don't really resemble a real dinosaurs in ways that I don't think are animal. good for the design. Right, I mean, it's very cartoonified. I would not have been surprised if this was a Camp Cretaceous design. Because I feel like it's ugly in the same ways as a lot of those. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but it's not know, a that show. I could almost see that as well, because like if you had ran with the concept of like, oh, they have incomplete DNA and they filled in the missing bits with amphibian DNA, I could see how you could get to something that approaches the look of this creature seen before me mm-hmm. here. But like if the InGen scientists took a swab and went down into like a dumpster in the subway and ran it around, we're like, here's for Donaticus. Yeah. Right. We're using environmental DNA to fill in the gaps. They, they it produce, could be anything. They, they produce the Donaticus genome. Oops, all frog. I have a question. Is it ever explained why they use frogs specifically? Yes. Um, yeah, so in the book, they don't only use frogs. Um, they actually use a lot of different things uh, and frogs were used to patch some, the, like the DNA of some animals. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact justification of it, but those are also in the book the only ones that are able to breed. So it's like it's a small subset of the species in Jurassic Park, which includes Velociraptor, mm-hmm. um, Sora, and yeah, I think some of the dryosaurs were breeding too. I think T Rex. T Rex wasn't breeding, but that's why it couldn't see movement. It's because of the frog. Oh right. Right, right. I know. I'm just thinking, like logically, in a real world scenario, mm-hmm. why would you use frogs to catch things? Because science, science, and genetic science in the 1990s was real crude. It I, may have been one of the first things we had a genome for, actually. I, okay. I like, that would be, that oh. would explain it, but I wouldn't be surprised if the real answer to the question is essentially a working backwards answer of the real reason why they did that is because they wanted the is because Triton wanted the plot point of they could change sex and reproduce and went like oh what's an animal that does that and went with frogs oh yeah, yeah. I could also kind of see it and, and this is not really I would say a correct way of thinking about the problem but if you were like not tremendously 
in the world of like phylogenetics and also genetics being like you know frogs are pretty primitive like maybe they're like a good base to like fill in large swaths of missing dna like you know like they might be the the, the fundament upon which all things are built uh, is a frog genome which is not the case and i'm not endorsing that idea I but say, i could I see if, it if your understanding of evolution is stuck in the 1800s i think it is also a little bit along dalton's point though Xenopus has been really important in medical research, and Michael mm-hmm. Crichton was a doctor. And so I think it yeah. kind of, for him, was a very natural model organism that they would use because, like, sure. they were used for pregnancy tests. I think they would inject, mm-hmm. like, like wouldn't they inject women's urine into the frog and see if it ovulated or something? Yeah, it's something really weird like that. <laughs> it's like yeah, a it's witch's perfect. apothecary. It, it, well, yeah, I it, mean, because it, the it's estrogen either that would make the frogs them... or it's that with the rabbits. It's one of the two. It's frogs. I remember this from when I took developmental bio. I remember us talking about this because, mm, yeah, wow. Xenopus is a model model organism yeah. for a lot of developmental stuff, too. I yeah, and I, birth- I just checked. It is literally that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I missed my birth control for the week. All right, let me get the frog. <laughs> get the piss frog. <laughs> yeah. You know and it was over 99% accurate, which is, I think, about as good as modern, very high-tech pregnancy tests is just inject frog. So what you're saying? is we need to get back to the practice of injecting frogs. I am not yeah. saying that. I do not in- endorse injecting frogs with urine. I want to be very clear. Can I, uh... uh let me be clear. Do you guys uh, know, the... on the like, thought of, like, high-tech pregnancy tests, are you aware of, like, the internal structure of, like, the digital runs, that, like, that digital readout? Uh, uh, no, I've never had to be aware of them before. Also, a tiny so frog like, in there. Uh, well, they don't have a tiny frog, but essentially, like pregnancy <laughs> tests are kind of read like a COVID test, where like fluid goes up a wicking strip, mm-hmm. and there are like two lines. There's a control line and a positive line, and um, that's all they are, and that's all the digital ones are too. All of the digital bits are a camera that looks at the lines and then turns oh, it, like so tells funny. the screen to activate if it is like on or off it's not like the computer's really like testing the the composition of the the sample or anything it's just a camera for looking at the uh the lines on the stick and like those aren't always the most intuitive things to read so i think there's probably some value in that but it does also (laughs) it's like that's the high tech part is a camera that's that's very funny american yeah i want to i want to (laughs) briefly get back to the frog dna point though if that's okay um, I, I think it's interesting to read Jurassic Park because I don't know if a lot of viewers of this channel know this, but my master's degree is not in paleontology. I did a master's in human like physiology and biophysics. I was briefly toying with the idea of becoming a doctor. And so like, it's not like I've gone through medical school or anything, but I have, uh, like I had a fair, fairly decent amount of like biomedical coursework that I had to do. And it's interesting to read Jurassic Park through that lens of like, this is what Michael Crichton actually really understood and knew. And so like, he's clearly porting on a a biomedical perspective to evolutionary bio. One other reason I think he might've used frogs is that if you read the book, it's never really explicitly stated, but it feels to me like he is kind of drawing from all different tetrapod groups to imagine what dinosaurs would be like. Like, he's not doing it the way we would now because the next ant phylogenetic bracket wasn't a concept that existed yet. Whitmer published that paper six years later um, in 95. And so instead of doing the, you know, okay, crocs are like this and birds are like this, so we'll reconstruct dinosaurs as somewhere along that axis. He was saying, okay, we've got birds, we've got crocodiles, we've got lizards, we've got snakes, we've got amphibians. Dinosaurs are another extinct tetrapod group. So we can mix and match traits from within there into what dinosaurs are. I, like I don't think. That. Well, yeah, because he doesn't add mammals. I'm sorry, right? But he doesn't add mammalian traits. I think he clearly sees mammals as something distinct. He does. Des- yeah. he does describe a lot of the herbivores as very mammaly. I, I remember yes. a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the descriptions of hadrosaurs. He refers to them specifically as cow-like. That's true, uh, and you know what? It feels right vibes wise. It does feel I, right vibes wise, and, and so that's okay. But, you know, like adding venom into Dilophosaurus, which is, you know, mostly a squamate or amphibian thing. Um, no a lot of bird-like cows. traits. Notably not cows. No venomous cows, as far as yes. I know. But when I put chocolate milk in my whiskey later today, we'll find <laughs> out if we can simulate a venomous cow. Don't do that because it'll curdle. 
Learn from my mistakes. Do not add dairy <laughs> to alcohol. Well, actually, I guess it might not. I was thinking, sorry, I just had such a potent flashback to adding Bailey's to that orange liquor and it turning to instant cat food. It was disgusting. It was so funny, though. Jesus. It's an interesting perspective to take on reconstructing dinosaurs. I think it allowed for a lot of creative freedom. Um, but it's not how we would actually do it in a phylogenetically informed perspective. But I believe they specifically mentioned using lizard, bird, and frog DNA, and maybe crocodile DNA as well to fill holes. And I don't remember if there was rationale given for which holes were filled with what. The frog DNA goes in the square hole. <laughs> um, you know, this is actually... Eh, I'll leave through my copy of the book later, and we can put a note so, on screen here if I'm wrong. But anyway, what does it mean, Alex? You... I don't even want. I don't even want to do it anymore. I can. I can do it then. It is Unless your job. Do it. No, do it. All right, fine. All right. So, Deinonychus and Terapus. What does its name mean? Well, Deinonychus translates roughly to terrible claw. Terrible as in the biblical sense, like fearfully great, not like it sucks. And Antirapus. This, this is terrible. This one sucks. This is a terrible claw. <laughs> this and is body. a terrible claw. <laughs> and Antirapus translates roughly to counterbalancing in reference to its long, stiff tail that uh, John Ostrom uh, described as having these ossified tendons that would make it very immobile and help the animal counterbalance in kind of a seesaw way when it was walking horizontally. You know, this one does look like a seesaw. <laughs> a little it, bit. It, it's got that lopey kind of hyena-esque I, body plan. I don't know. Don't insult hyenas by comparing them to this thing because they it's look lopsided in a like. way that works. It's like, ah, yeah, that's a creature. This looks like a seesaw in the playground sense of like, you could. I just want to like hit it on one end. I hope those Deinonychus corpses that we just airlifted out of here get buried at sea like Megatron. <laughs> <laughs> what I meant by hitting it, like hitting a seesaw, like I'm imagining like dropping an anvil on a seesaw. Like that's <laughs> that's exactly what I'm thinking about. Or like, no, like the the MythBusters episode where they put a little doll on a seesaw and drop like a boulder on it, and oh, she yeah. launches a million feet in the air. It's wonderful. You, it's so if good. I might. Yeah. What this reminds me of is like a recent gen Pokemon, like like so, like a Pokemon that was originally like two things, like a little tadpole and then a salamander, and then someone's like, it's got an, it's need, it needs a third one. What if we just put stupid legs on it? <laughs> and this is it. It's a salamander that they're like, it's a it's a dinosaur now. You know, I could see that. I, I could see a way of making this an appealing Pokemon design, but it's definitely not an appealing dinosaur design. No, but what's funny, and I think this is worth mentioning, is that most of the design is really an existing dinosaur design in spirit. Yes, it is. Um, I think it's very clear that the design for Deinonychus in this game was based on the original life reconstruction of Deinonychus that was drawn by... Um, I was about to say a friend of the channel, but he doesn't know about the channel, I don't think. <laughs> Robert Bacher. He's a friend of me. He he might. I don't know. I may or may not have mentioned it when I met him last year. It's possible remember. he knows about the channel. I possible don't think he watches. Possible friend of the channel. Hopeful friend. In, Bob in spirit friend of the channel who has apparently defended my honor at a conference that I wasn't at. That was, yeah, that Amelia. was the same time. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> That's a cool dude. We support our it, friends. Based Giga Chat. Squad. I'm Bob Bacher. going to close the blind here in the hope that it can somehow trap more heat next to my desk because it is how so cold. cold. It's so cold. Dalton, it's it's obscene how cold it is. In you our should apartment. turn on the furnace, me. I'm, I, I can't sleep at night. I'm so cold. Please. We you know, I miss that. Here, but... Although, I North there, Carolina, it's cold. Oh, For God. Oh, there. God. You just snapped to it and I saw its stupid textures. Oh. Wow. All right, it's should we... bumpy. Where was Continue. that drawing? Where was the drawing of Deinonychus published? Is it in the 1969 monograph? I, I can't find it. Either in the monograph or it was published. But the one published. in the monograph looks better. It does. But I think this is based on that. 
Either that or it was like uh, marketing material that was published along with it. Right. Let me let me see if I can find. <coughs> oh, pardon it's me. I'm sorry. Not, it's not in the original one. Maybe it's in the original announcement paper. No. It might be in this paper describing the Harvard specimen. Hold on. I'm flipping through all of my Deinonychus papers. He's flipping. I'm flipping. Um, it was, at least according to this source, it was in the Osteology of Deinonychus. Yes, it is. Well, is it? Because it's not even in the character in the figure list. It's on the first, like, it's it's before the title. Um, oh, it's a frontispiece. Right, yes. there we go. There we are. Yeah, and so we'll put it on screen. Um, of course. Back back into... Yeah. So this reconstruction um, was drawn by Bob Bakker when he was the undergrad at Yale, working in John Ostrom's lab, which is really... picture Bob Bakker like that. Well, uh, yeah, and apparently he looked quite different in those days. I think this was before he'd kind of found his vibe. Hmm. And so from people who knew him, they were like, he he basically came back from summer break at some point, and they were like, what happened? He metamorphosed. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) He he emerged from his chrysalis as the fully formed Bob Bakker. He became Um, cooler. And if if you are unaware of what Bob Bakker looks like, um, one... Google's free. You can look him up. But two, um, the... Here's a picture of Bob Bakker. Two, here's a picture of Bob Bakker. And three, the paleontologist character in the second Jurassic Park movie is heavily based on yeah. Bob Bakker. The guy yeah. who uh, gets scared of a snake under a waterfall and then gets eaten by the T-Rex and the waterfall turns red. That's Bob Bakker. I that, would actually go so far as to say, I'm sorry, Dalton, were you going to say something? Oh, I was going to say that that, Lego char- that, that that character in Lego form, because Shelby and I have been playing Lego Jurassic World, and that game is awesome, um, looks like me. And Shelby was like, oh, it's oh. you. <laughs> they have a Lego you. And then he got eaten by a T-Rex. Right. Sorry, I thought I muted my mic for that. Um, you, you didn't. Dude, I'm so sorry. Um, um, uh, wait, but before before we move on, uh, do, you all, do you all know the fun little possibly apocryphal story around the addition of that character in the second movie? No. Yes. So this was uh, during the height of the whole um, was T-Rex a hunter or a scavenger debate? Wait, I'm sorry, Scott. I actually know this story isn't true. What's funny about that to me also is that Bakker canonically exists because in the first movie, the kid says he read the book by him. And, and then he liked it more, right? And it was bigger than Grant's and had more illustration. And uh, then no, wait, no. shuts the car door in his face. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, so the, 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 the punchline of the story I was going to tell um, that is being modified here, I guess, that I'm not sure is now accurate, is that I heard that after Bakker um, saw the movie, he called up Horner and left a message on his answering machine that all it said was, I told you they were hunters, and then he hung up. I do think this is true. Uh, That part is true. However, there is going to be a cruelly redacted part of this video where I tell the true story. So anyway, to get back to the story of the illustration, so Bob Bakker draws this life reconstruction of Deinonychus for the initial long form description of Deinonychus. Deinonychus was described um, in two papers in 1969. The first one came out slightly beforehand and it was a very short paper that if I'm going here just to make sure, I'm trying to remember why it was published in two separate papers. Oh, basically, apparently, um, so Colbert and Russell were doing a new study of Dromaeosaurus, which the only specimen of which is at the AMH, and, and they needed to cite Ostrom's paper about Deinonychus, and he was too slow getting the monograph together, and so he wrote in like a, f- a less than 10-page paper just naming it hmm. and describing the things that were needed so that they could reference his paper, 
And then the monograph came out that year anyway, and it didn't really, it didn't really <laughs> wind up mattering. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of the monograph, I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I was thinking of the right um, image. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a first edition copy on a books, which is side note, a very good website for finding cool books. Do we want to play Price is Right? I would like to, yeah. Oh, yeah. First edition Osteology of Deinonychus. Okay. Dal Dalton, are you going to whine if you lose again that the rules to this game are stupid? Well, are we playing by good rules or Price is Right rules? We are <laughs> playing by Price is Right rules, which is you have to get as close as you can without getting right. over. That's no, how the game the works. Rule. I did not invent the game. I know. The rule. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at not Bob Barker, but Bob Barker. <laughs> Who I also doubt Whoa. invented the prices Whoa. right, but he certainly hosted it. Um, how many pages is right. it? I think that's going to be a factor. That I don't know. It's a lot. I can get that. I can get yeah. that for you. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's 186 pages. Okay, I've got it. And from the photographs on the website, it looks to be in good condition. One hundred and eighty dollars. Okay. Two hundred and fifty. Okay. Three seventy-five. One hundred ninety-nine dollars. Alex has won. I put it in the chat. Y'all are so so low. It is thirty-five hundred dollars. I was <laughs> way off. You can get it online oh, for free. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a first edition. It is a first edition. Wow. Oh my edition. god. It's a collector's piece, folks. Uh, yeah, no. I was um, really hoping this was something I could buy right now, and I know, it is that's not. <laughs> what I think was happening here in your guesses, but no. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Goodness um, gracious. Goodness gracious. Well, anyway, that goes to say how important this paper was. <laughs> Yeah, and, how, and I mean, you know, respect. Sorry, I would just say like it's there's a reason it's that expensive, which is that I'm sure a lot of people would very much like to have a first edition copy of, of it. Yeah, so I'm sorry for interrupting you there, Amelia. I got very excited when you started talking about how important it was, and I couldn't contain myself anymore. But <laughs> I see. It, it, it's. I mean, there is an argument to be made that this is the most important piece of research that came out like before the discovery of feathered dinosaurs in dinosaur paleontology as a whole um and i would actually argue maybe even more important than the, i mean no the feathered dinosaurs are landmark in, in such an irreplaceable way but like top five easily top oh, yeah. five mm -hmm. right it's like first ever dinosaurs archaeopteryx dinonychus right. yeah Dinonychus, Sinoceropteryx, and um i would say nesting cytopody was really important as well for yeah. a lot of this stuff right Here's Here's a question, a thought game I'll play with you all. Because speaking of like this in the context of the feathered dinosaurs, and, and this story might make more sense as we talk more about the monarchy, but if the feathered dinosaurs in China had been found before Deinonychus, if Deinonychus hadn't set the stage for the dinosaur-bird connection, do you think the gut check reaction of like most people looking at those things would have just been, oh, these are strange birds, as opposed to making the dinosaur bird no. Yes. Ooh, Alex, we will do battle. <laughs> Here's why I think something's no. rotten in the state of the crew. We had Archaeopteryx for a hundred years, mm -hmm. and everybody just talked about how it was a bird and didn't notice extremely obvious similarities with theropod dinosaurs until Ostrom like did an exhaustive job showing that they were there. To the degree that, and I was just reading his papers on this before we recorded the episode again, um, like, they described its hand as bird-like. <coughs> it does not have a bird-like hand. It has a Silurosaurian dinosaur hand. Like, the, the amount of wishful thinking that went into making Archaeopteryx a more typical bird because it had feathers, to me implies that I think had the connection not been already made, I don't know if we would have understood I think it would have taken a lot of yeah. research. I, you know, I think it would have had happened, it happened. Right, right, right. I'm not saying it would have been impossible, but I think the immediate recognition of this is exactly what we would have expected. Look, birds are dinosaurs. I think it would have been like something that took a while to emerge. Because honestly, Archaeopteryx was enough to show that. 
and Archaeopteryx was misinterpreted until we had Deinonychus to compare it to. An interesting point. Counter. Uh, they found dromaeosaurs in the Ishion, uh that are also pretty obviously theropods. I, I, okay, I see what you're getting at. I guess it kind of depends on which And also a lot of things ones. that are like, I don't know, die long with feathers. Someone might have been like, hmm. Well, I guess if it was die long, if it was you, Tyrannus, then it would be like, oh, this is obviously a dinosaur and, there, and here's this dinosaur feather and then dinosaur bird connection. But if it was Microraptor, well, maybe yeah, but that not. It's the... a weird bird. Sure, something, something, and even Codipteryx, which was for a while yeah. considered to be a weird bird. No, no, yeah, but I mean, I mean, like, just if that had, if Deinonychus had never been found, and then that discovery happened the same way, I, I think, yeah, I think, I think, it's pretty obvious. I, I think it would have needed to be a Dromaeus or a Troodontus. Honestly, though. frankly, you know, I think the Mongolian expeditions in the '90s would have just done, would, would have done it as well. Right. Well, I, but I mean, I think that's not exactly. I think what Dalton's saying is, if we didn't have good skeletal material of a Salurosaur, oh, yeah, right, yes. right, what would we have needed to get there? And I think that your point is probably right. If it were a Dromaeus or a Troodontid, but like, I think I two know, things. One of two things would have happened, right? Sorry, you go ahead. Because I mean, people in in a, I think in Poland or the USSR were also figuring it out at about the same time. It was later. It was independent, but it was later. Right, but I mean, like, later by a matter of years. Yes. I Again, I'm not saying we would have never figured it out, but I think Dalton's point is, like, if we had found feathered Sinoceropteryx in a world without good comparative skeletal material that had already been interpreted in this way a little bit, and that being an active debate, would we have seen feathered Sinoceropteryx as the first, like, good Solurosaur fossil, and it has primitive feathers? And known that what it was saying was that birds were dinosaurs. Because I think yeah, it would be I very possible. I think it would have been very possible that the initial interpretation of Sinoceropteryx was that it was a bird. Or that um, those were not feathers. Which was another point that was argued for decades, right? Like, are they feathers or are they collagen fibers from the epidermis that are, like, sloughing off? Maybe they're pycna fibers. Or would it have been they interpreted might be as, like, fibers. a... Uh an independent, like, picodont, like, right. feathered proto-avis kind of thing. Well, I think, I mean, honestly, without the debate that built up around Deinonychus, I'm not sure, like, would, would the people who are still super, like, if that was the first piece of evidence they were hit with, it was like, here's what looks like a theropod that has feathers. Because, I mean, like, even, even friend of the channel, Alan Fiducia, like, I don't think early, he's a friend of the channel. He has early papers and stuff uh, where he's basically like, oh yeah, you know, John Oster make a really good point with like the scapula dynamic. It's highly bird-like. Like he was not opposed from moment one. Right. No, he wasn't. I just, my read on this is, I think, a little bit informed by how much evidence was present and was misinterpreted prior to Deinonychus. I I don't know how things like I agree with you know I think I don't think anybody is saying it never would have been understood without Deinonychus like I, I think that would be a, a a straw man argument right like eventually we would have gotten there but if the chain of steps is different you know if you don't have Deinonychus emerging you probably don't get a lot of, and like the dinosaur renaissance emerging from that and we'll get into all of this in a moment I don't know if you get the push for funding and research on dinosaurs that actually even enables the Mongolian expeditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Y you know, like, those cost a lot of money. They, it happened because of Dinomania, which happened because of Deinonychus. Um, but, like, let's go back in the 20th century, right? Every textbook talks about how bird-like the construction of the hind limb of theropod dinosaurs is. Mm -hmm. But makes a note that birds are not theropod dinosaurs, and this is all convergent. You know, we talk a lot about the furcula, which was like, you know, interpreted in Velociraptor early on, in, like in the late 90s as a science paper. This is, you know, by um, my doctoral advisor, Mark Norell, and, and some of his colleagues. I think it was Jim and Mark and Pete McAvicky, right? I think the, it was that the structure paper. that people who just celebrated Thanksgiving might know better is the wishbone. I think it is. 
Yeah. Right. The furcula being the fused clavicles of a bird that become the wishbone. Right. Right. So that was found in Velociraptor and that was a big deal. You know what else has it that was found in the 20s? Seriously. Oviraptor. Oh, Oviraptor. So we had a very bird-like dinosaur skeleton with a furcula, which was labeled in the paper. It was labeled as an interclavicle, which I can understand as being part of the homology thing, but Osborne labeled a lot of things wrong because as we've covered, he wasn't actually a very good anatomist. Um, I know. Gift oh, no. I see all of the evidence that was in front of people and was not being understood in the right context. And I do wonder, even with a slam dunk feathered dinosaur, would we have immediately made that connection? I think it depends on when it was found and what tools there were. Like if we had good thecodont morphological character matrices for like archosaurs and you slot that in it's like oh wow it's coming up as a dinosaur with feathers maybe i don't know i don't know I, it's hard to say i mean i i think i think it's telling that even when sinosauropteryx came out like the gut reaction from the naysayers was not this is a weird bird it's these aren't feathers because i mean some of these things are just like you, you have to make them not feathers because there's no way it's... A... Right. Right. I, I think that's a fair point. Um, I, I... But on the other hand, when it's Archaeopteryx and it's clearly a a, bur a thing with feathers and obvious dinosaur characteristics, it, it became... It's not actually a dinosaur. It's just a bird, which is just a lie about what the anatomy is. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, that was also kind of framed around like archaic thoughts of like structural, like Dolo's law. Like, a little I, bit, I, I right. Think, I think changing, like, interpretive frameworks would probably have just yielded the same thing. Yeah, oh, and I mean, again, I'm not saying it never would have happened, but what would the initial response have been? But I think this argument is academic. I hope our viewers are happy to see what scientists argue about when they have time to just interact with one another. This is what we all live for somehow. Um... Also, I think it's worth maybe noting that a lot of our disagreements about this like kind of relate to the iterative nature of science. And I think this is the strength science has as a way of knowing that everything is built on prior stuff. And it can be hard to figure out how the chain of discovery would progress if you didn't have every step in the pathway where it is in, you know, it's a chaotic system, right? So every step in the past that you change can have unpredictable effects on what we discover in the future. So it matters a lot how things are interpreted. Water drops out of the back of your head. Which way will it roll off? Right. I, hey, uh, you're not flirting with me there, Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> or I, am I? You might be. I feel like Emperor Palpatine. Because everything just proceeded as I had foreseen. I, I'm i so glad. I set that up, and you and Alex played your roles so perfectly. That could not have gone better. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there a payoff to this or just that? I thought that I, I found it interesting and I think the audience would find it interesting. And I think it speaks yeah. to the importance of Deinonychus that we can have an argument that the linchpin of two different points of view is like how important this fossil and how necessary Dalton. it is. Dalton, what's, mo what's most important though is who do you think's right? Am I right? Tell me I'm right. I, I don't know. I think I'm a little I'm a little more on James's side, but I, I, I concede that the, many of the feathered dinosaurs are just like obviously dinosaurs. But let's move forward. So... Besides the fact that mm -hmm. the Ostrom monograph opened with this really iconic, well, especially for the time, iconic image of Deinonychus, one of the most uh, fascinating things about that was how the animal was depicted. That it was previously... Dinosaurs were always depicted as these slow-moving, stupid, sluggish, uh, cold-blooded beasts that were kind of wandering around, dragging their tails, essentially kind of waiting to die. Um, um uh, actually? To be, like, superseded by the much more superior males. Kind of a, a, a depiction that you see in things like Fantasia and stuff like that. Uh, where that's so good. it's it's very good but like the 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 dinosaurs are depicted as basically these almost mindless brutes in a lot of ways sure, uh, I mean, yeah i mean i just 
pretty in its sense. Oh, it's it's amazing. We've talked about it several times on here before, uh, and it's so cool. And I've rewatched it a couple times since. It's God, it, it holds up. Well, it doesn't not scientifically, but artistically and everything. It's mm-hmm. it's unparalleled. It's so good. But um, one of the key features mm. of this Deinonychus reconstruction that Bakker did was the fact that it's doing exactly what this critter here is doing. It was at full sprint. This thing was running flat out, which is not something that we really saw dinosaurs depicted as doing before this. Trying to get it into the pose, and this is about as, as much as we can get. Yeah, because it, it runs with its head kind of down, not in the back kind of tail up noble animal position that the Bakker one does, which also I, I will just say about this design while we're talking about the Bakker illustration, I would be so much kinder to this thing if it didn't have the f-ing amphibian fins on it. If they literally just made a like 3D version of the Bakker Deinonychus, mm-hmm. I'd be a bit kinder to it. Yeah, but there's no kindness here, only rage. Only rage, only rage and hatred and disappointment that, like, as has been hopefully made clear, this is one of the most important dinosaurs that has ever been found. And the fact that me, a paleontologist, in the first trailer of Jurassic World Evolution that showed Deinonychus had no idea that this was supposed to be Deinonychus, uh, I thought... It was possibly Guanlong or something like that, given that weird ass head crest. And like, I know it's soft tissue. If you if you look at it, it's obvious. It's obviously supposed to be some sort of like rooster's comb or something like that. It has big, weird scales all over it. Same thing with the fin on its tail. But still, it's heinous. And I think, I mean, it's terrible. It's a terrible design. One thing that I think is also really important about Deinonychus is that this is not just an art, or the description of Deinonychus, rather. This was not just an artistic choice that Bob Bakker made in that illustration. There's a section of the paper dedicated to the, like, habits of Deinonychus, where Ostrom talks explicitly about the way that this must have been an agile, fairly intelligent, and highly, like, metabolically active animal because it had weaponry on its feet that implied to Ostrom that it was kicking and grappling with its feet. And that this isn't something that a very sluggish animal could do. Um, And so it's not just, like, everybody saw the artwork and was like, oh my god, that's going to change the way I think about this. It was coupled in directly with the paper in a beautiful way. So you've got this striking visual that's the first time a dinosaur had really been depicted running like that. Mixed with like a really good scientific justification of why that's what uh, why that choice was made. Um it's simply it. stunning. We love it. We love to see it. I'm desperately now looking for um a paper I was reading recently that has a wonderful piece of description that I think really speaks to Scott's point. And I can't find it. Um, Don't yell. Sorry. Don't swear. No swearing. This is language. <laughs> is that did that help? That, yeah, that made me happy. <laughs> Somebody else say something. Um, it's a this is a perversion of beauty. Yeah. Its eyes don't even face forward. It doesn't even have binocular vision. It's terrible. No, it's. It, well, we we talked about we talked about the head crest, and I think maybe if we can. Once James finds this thing, maybe we start at the head and work our way down. But I just wanted to ask, what y'all, what, what do we think is supporting this crest internally to make it just so hatred, rigid? Because like anger, it, fear. It is obviously supposed to be a pretty soft, fleshy structure, based on how it's been constructed. But it's so um, tall. It's it, all the thoughts leaving its head. <laughs> I, I mean, it just I, kind of supposed I, to be a rooster, like. Well, it's like I, if they wanted it to be a rooster, it'd make it a rooster, like make it a rooster so comb. I would have liked that so much more. That would have been funny and kind of looked nice, but like it's featureless and boring. Like, and viewer, this is this is not to say viewer singular viewer, 
Um, By this point in the video, probably. <laughs> this this is not to say that um, that dinosaurs in general or Deinonychus specifically could not have had some sort of soft tissue no. structure on its head that even could have possibly looked like this. Mm -hmm. There is a chance of that. So you're um, telling me there's a chance. So you're telling me there's a chance. Like, um, I mean, so many birds have so many weird soft tissue display structures on their head and neck and stuff like that. Uh, take a look at our uh, Dilophosaurus video where we talk about like the weird inflatable display structures on prairie chickens and sage grouse and stuff like that. Um, the turkeys that woke me up this morning by <laughs> literally not getting out of the way of a cop car and trying to fight it. That was very, very funny. Um, and, and then a bus, too. They literally stopped a bus. It was great. Um, they have big, weird, gross, fleshy um, display structures on their heads. Um, so Deinonychus possibly could have as well. It probably would not have looked exactly like this, and to Dalton's point, it wouldn't have been as rigid as this. Um, a structure like this probably would have been a little floppy, uh, but yeah, if anything, I, I had imagined, well, I mean, I, I guess one of the big one of the multiple many elephants in the room of this critter is, oh my god, it would have feathers. Yeah. That goes it's to one saying. of the ones with, like, it's like the Ornithomimosaurs, and with, like, just, it, it featherless feels, even if this were, like, a slightly better design, it feels deeply wrong. Mm-hmm. God, it's yeah. so well, why don't we, while James is looking for this, for this quote. Wait, why oh, don't we... it, it was in the, it was, I was looking in the wrong paper. That's why I couldn't oh. find it. Boys. Uh, then we'll, then yes. we'll give it a second. What, I, I what were we going to say? I'm going to say this. Uh-huh. Yeah, but starting with its head, um, it, it does do an important Dromaeosaur feature better than the velo every Velociraptor model in this game. What's that? Which is? It's that the tooth row does not go back. Oh, into the yeah. Orbit. Does it, it not? Actually, it stops. It looks like it stops about at the lacrimal. It would, I think, in Deinonychus proper, it actually would. It stops sooner, but yeah, all Dromaeosaurs it stops prior to the lacrimal. But yeah. that that's better. Once it screams, that's that's my positive thing. Better look at it. It also yeah. doesn't have a weird like. There we go. Oh, you're right. Someone at some point crazy. Tried it's, something. It's got lips. Um, is nice, a nice thing. Yeah, kind of always has its mouth open, so you can never really tell. But, but that also seems to just be like a holdover from the, the Jurassic Park Grovian sword sign. They pretty much all, to, to my recollection, have uh, have lips. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I found the quote. Okay. Okay. So this comes from Lawrence Lamb, 1917, in his original description of Gorgosaurus, where he talks about its long bird-like hind limbs and its light build for its body size, um, how the bones were hollow, um, you know, all of this stuff. The tail was that of a land animal with a circular cross section and, you know, firm muscles that and the ability to be a counterbalance for the rest of the body. Then he says, was this reptile agile, alert, and quick of movement? Was it capable of capturing its prey by a sudden rush from some place of concealment or by overtaking it after a pursuit, possibly of some length? Was its victim eaten when killed? Did it engage in spirited encounters with its own kind, as depicted in Knight's well-known restoration of Dryptosaurus, in accordance with Cope's views subsequently modified? The writer believes that Gorgosaurus was sluggish and not a quick mover, and that it fed not on the fresh flesh of animals necessarily of its own killing, but rather on carcasses found or stumbled across during its hunger-impelled wanderings. So he's... Across. It's hunger-impelled wanderings. This is me at two o'clock in the morning in my apartment as I <laughs> drift through my apartment. <laughs> but, like, the, hold on. I, I'm, I'm picturing David Attenborough narrating his hunger impelled wanderings have driven this creature to be in front of the fridge at 2 a.m. eating <laughs> shredded cheese directly right. out of the bag. So, there is a it's just lost <laughs> Alex. He said hold on. Alex said hold on. There's like a, an <laughs> axiom of biology. 
that form follows function. And I guess right, we just yeah. hadn't invented that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the joking, the joking, the non-joking answer is that we actually had. And that I guess Lord Slam didn't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> so Alex pointed out the only good detail of this model, um, I'm which is that the tooth row is fully antorbital, as they say, which is... Is that all theropods where it's fully antorbital? Um, no, but it, it's derived like Solorosaurus. It, it always the tooth row never goes below or behind. I think it the happens orbit. pretty early, but things like Coelophysis, yeah. I think, have a tooth row that go behind the uh, the orbit. Well, right. like, and how? I mean, I'm just trying to think. It just kind of logically makes sense because I'm thinking about like lizards too. Like, it's rare that that bone. So in in the upper jaw of vertebrates it's, there's the maxilla that's the bone that has the teeth in it of the upper, upper jaw save for like the paddle teeth and pre-max teeth up front and the next bone under the eye is the jugal which never has teeth on it so it just kind of makes sense like right we i mean so there's in in, in several theropods there's kind of this it thin could, strap like, of the maxilla yeah, that i was gonna say like that's the only way it could happen um and that it, um, it's often a tooth bearing you know like well uh, not theropods yeah. but like rocks and stuff but yeah, no, Allosaurus actually, I think Allosaurus is also antorbital. Or yeah. Like it's, it, or it's like right under the orbit. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, and crocodiles tend to be like that as well. I think as adults, uh, as juveniles, I believe the... I did a thesis on crocodilian ontogeny. I should ontogeny. remember this. Ontogeny. I'm going to live fact check James by going to oh. up an alligator skull in the next room. I'm live fact checking myself. All yeah, time okay, well, thesis. I'm also we'll live checking, uh, live fact well, checking both of you on Allosaurus, and I don't see it going below or behind the orbit. That's what, what I said. It's antorbital. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. And, on something like Coelophysis. Yes. 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 Okay. Sorry. I, yeah. I in looking that up, I thought you said it was like that in Allosaurus too. I was like, no, you're not. It, you're high. But well. I'm sorry, I was misremembering the detail in crocodilians. The tooth row always ends under the orbit, at least an alligator, but ontogenetically it moves further forward. Hmm. So it goes much further back under the orbit in um in the juveniles. I was misremembering that transformation. Um, and, laugh at James. Yeah, and everybody like, laugh at me. I was like just my I was live checking myself or just like, yeah, reminding myself that like I've got a little Tuatara skull. And yeah, it's basically what happens when it sweeps under the eyes. If it's like it's it sweeps inward so that the jugal comes out and around to form the bottom of the eyeball. That's around. A thing that happens in all things with skulls, basically. Well, yeah, um, comparative anatomy. Right. Sometimes homology helps. Yeah. <laughs> Only homology. Um, 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 I think that. The rest of this design is fairly excusable if you are using Ostrom's drawing as a reference. Um, one thing that's... Ba I'm sorry, Bacher's drawing, yes. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that it does not have a pronounced pubic boot. Um, because, like, if you actually notice on the Velociraptor model in the movies, right, they've got a really, really pronounced boot for the pubis coming down in the body wall. And this doesn't have that. And what's funny about that is that um, they misidentified the coracoid of the original Deinonychus specimens that were investigated as the pubis. And so they reconstructed oh, it with the... Oh, I think it says the issue. I thought it was the as issue. the pubis. I, I, I think it says... We're going to live fact-check each other. Somebody else say Some something. Some more live fact-checking, folks. Brought to you by... Well, I could see them mistaking the, a coracoid for a pubis because they both have a hole in it. Does, I don't think the Isium has a hole in it, unless dinosaurs are stupid. Um, it does in some dinosaurs, because primitively there's a foramen in both the pubis and the Ischium. Okay. Um, yeah, but Solarosaurs don't have either of them anymore. Whether that was fully known at the time, I don't know. Um, we're, but pretty, we're pretty cool. We're cool guys. I'm not buying this PDF. Give me the, give me the free version. There it is. I'm not buying this. Give it to me for free. <laughs> it's it, it, it really is like I, I never get more do you know who I am or where I work than when I try to access a PDF and it doesn't register. It doesn't have Harvard on the list of 
uh, of <laughs> institutions. Yeah. I get so like I- insert Cave Johnson voice. Do you know who I am? <laughs> Okay, so if, if if we're continuing moving down from no, we're the not. Head, we're, we're checking. No, never mind. We're checking the. We're oh. racing to fact check. <sighs> I'm I gotta read. I'm reading. I'm reading at speeds never observed before. In the meantime, I'll make it's a blue the, point. It's the pubis. Oh, no, it can't <laughs> uh-huh. be. And Amelia is exactly right. The coracoid foramen was mistaken to be the obturator foramen that solarosaurs don't have because in solarosaurs the ventral walling of the obturator foramen is lost and it's only present as a notch. But cool. that's exactly what they did. Damn. They got me. Um, oh my god, yeah, that's idiot. obviously a cork. <laughs> it is so obviously a cork. That's rough. Coin. Listen, I've got a lot of respect for John Ostrom because he did a lot of really foundational work with very little material-wise. Like, he basically had Deinonychus, Compsognathus, and Archaeopteryx. And he figured out a lot of stuff that was only, like, proven definitively after a lot more fossils have been collected. However, sometimes he makes a very silly mistake, uh, such as the obvious coracoid with a, like, a, as, a, as a glenoid for the humorous. Yeah, that one's rough. Uh, and he's just like... Viewers, viewers. point and laugh. It's a, it's a laugh. childish mistake. <laughs> Yes. I could see it happening for like I was thinking like thinking of like Pylosaurus, right? Like none of the, the pelvic elements are fused to each other. But like in a dinosaur you don't have that excuse. Like if you have the clenoid, like there's no there's no excuse, you know. The, I mean the the pelvis was unfused in the Deinonychus specimens that he was working with. Like, well, like because you know it fuses I mean. late in ontogeny. Right, but I know, no, but, right. But they like contact the surfaces, each other. I'm sure don't yeah, they, they touch each other. Like there's no with the at least Gross. with Pylosaurus, like they yeah. they touch each other but they don't leave imprints of each other on the bone. Like the acetabulum like does not exist. And actually like, it does, kind of, but you know, you know what I mean. That brings me right. to something that I think that is an important point. Um that somewhere in the building where I work, beneath it lives a lot of the Deinonychus material. And I think people so often see um, like this as, as a fairly complete skeleton in museums. It's worth noting that the entire thing is disarticulated. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, with the um, exception of the tail, I think. Yeah, a lot of the, the tail bones were found in articulation. But yeah, it, and it's several individuals. I it, it, think it's at least three or four by Ostrom's count and possibly more. Like, that's the minimum number based on repeated elements. Yeah, that sounds right. Minimum three. I actually yeah, didn't I know think, that. Yeah, no, it's a lot. Uh, and I mean, they have different numbers. It's not one number for every individual. Yeah. But um, it, it's much more of a nightmare than I think people understood yeah. or generally understand now. Like, you know, I, listen, talking about how much we've progressed in paleontology since then, there's a section of the monograph where he's like, let's try to figure out what kind of theropod Deinonychus is. He's like, here are my comparative taxa. Albertosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Allosaurus, Ornithomimus. Dude, Velociraptor was literally like a maybe two hour car ride away from well, no, no, no. He did have. Uh, he did also look at dromaeosaurs, but like in terms of well-preserved things, he could use to try to place it. Like, oh, and Compsognathus. Like mm-hmm. these were the canonical theropods. There were like six of them. <sighs> the canonical theropods. Right. When I am putting. Doing that. What the Same. canonical? Yes. Uh, uh, many moons ago, I think. Okay, I was accused. Okay, I'm not sure if this is my. What I've were been you doing accused a lot, of? And I can't. I can't figure out when I started to do it. I'm curious who inflicted this on who. It, it might have been me. But okay. yet he like, I mean, he just had so little to go off of to make these comparisons, right? Like he was able to recognize Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor. Um, mm-hmm. And and he also recognized Sornithlestes, or, or I'm sorry, Sornithoides and um, what was then called Stenonychosaurus, but is now generally called Troodon were similar to dromaeosaurs but seemed to be closer to each other than they were to the other dromaeosaurs which is exactly right based um but it was just there was so little material of theropods to really like use as a comparative collection i'm putting together a a big data set right now and i've got over 300 theropod specimens of it anyway what i'm saying is there's so much information now there was so little and it was this jumbled mess of bones belonging to multiple individuals 
and I believe found an association with Tenontosaurus. Ooh, is that a segue I detected? Hell yeah, brother. That's yeah, a segue. Bro. Are you yeah. riding on balancing wheels with a stick? That was That's a segue. segue. Oh, that, that really That was me. good. Oh, so Deinonychus is from the Cloverleaf Formation, and we've actually found quite a few Deinonychuses. And very often, they're found in or near Tenontosaurus. Now, we put some Tenontosaurus in the game, but it's not in the game. Um, so you have to imagine Tenontosaurus... You could have done Mataburus over it. Or uh, the, the other, the alternate model of Iguanodon, maybe? Recent, uh, recent, um... One of the pod phylogenies have found an source to be a rabbit dog. No, no, but I'm I'm just saying in terms yeah. of like I don't aesthetics. I don't think either one really looks a lot like Tenontosaurus they enough don't. to to warrant it, unfortunately. Um, but uh, there there are are numerous fossil finds of Deinonychus associated with this animal, and there are also finds of Tenontosaurus alone that are are like scattered with Deinonychus teeth. Um, it's, it's a known entity. It's a phenomenon that we've recorded before, is, is the relationship between Deinonychus and Tenontosaurus. Clearly, these things were eating those animals. Clearly, Deinonychus ate Tenontosaurus. Um, but it sparked some debate as to whether or not they were hunting them in packs. Um, if all of this sounds familiar to Velociraptor in Jurassic Park, just remember that that's because it's Deinonychus. Um, this was the original pack. Do we think that Deinonychus hunted in packs? Because there's an sort alternative, of. there's an alternative interpretation, um, which is that occasionally you will see, uh, famously on the Komodo Islands, around a large animal carcass, uh, a gathering and a mobbing of of large adult Komodo dragons, uh, going in to to eat them up, eat them up, eat them up, eat them up. Um, they've got the Reese's, they've got the peanut butter chocolate flavor, and they're gonna go eat them up. Um, I'm losing yeah, my mind. Just... Um, but anyway, these Komodo dragons swarm the carcass, and they, they're all eating. They didn't collaboratively hunt or, or um, have any or strategy shot. for this, but they they are, are coming to eat it. And so there is, you know, something to be said. Are these associations, especially with, like, large numbers of Donatosaur teeth around Donatosaurus, is this just a bunch of individuals feeding in a carcass? And then, of course, with the fossil record, you have to um, ask, were they even all together at the same time? Or are these multiple individuals coming to some some site right. at different times and all shedding teeth? It's, it, they're all things to consider. Uh, but what do we think about these various lines of evidence? Alex? And let us know in the comments what you think. The correct answer is uh, a incredibly unsatisfying sort of. <laughs> Which is, um, there's some stuff that is suggesting like active predation on these animals uh it, my i think my my favorite is a i think an ungule of the foot that is like embedded in the ossified tendons of i think a, another dynamics right Jesus no, I'm so, Christ. no it's a tooth no there's a there's, there's a toe claw a that's claw, underneath though. ossified tendons i've seen it okay that's wow. a it's gnarly wild. injury. But is that in Tenontosaurus or is that in a... I thought it was another Deinonychus, but I could be I thought it was another Deinonychus, too. So, so the occasionally so the this girls is, were fighting. So this is my... Yeah, so this is why I would like to, to come to this, in that there's evidence of active predation with bite... You know, like, I think they're hunting these... Possibly hunting the Tenontosaurus. Maybe. Or kind of mobbing it. I think they're probably... Like, a collection of these might have been killing these animals, but... Where I don't think, where, where I think we kind of drift, is often I think when we think of pack hunting, we're like thinking of uh, um, wolf or lion like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was probably more like kind of sometimes the coordinated hunting that happens with crocs and alligators, where it's kind of a loose aggregate mob. Um, and, you know, alligators and crocs often don't get along and they'll hiss and snap and bite, and sometimes eat each other. Um, so I, I could see Deinonychus doing the same thing, especially with, like, an animal breaking its claw off in the tail of another one. That's not, that's not, like, a fun, like, like not a social wound. That is a, <laughs> I am going to kill you. <laughs> I think we should see if we can make sure that this claw is not in a Tenontosaurus tail, because that I would radically change the 
go downstairs, please. Should I? Um, Should I? N- maybe after we finish recording and we'll pop up the answer on screen. Okay. I'm going to have a, a... Alex and I are really at war this episode. I've got a different interpretation. I think they were pack hunting, and I don't think we need to invoke that it's like crocodilian style, half pack hunting, half mobbing. Um, these animals had a much larger brain relative to their body size, and we know what cognitive capabilities birds have. What? Much. It is much larger. Is much. Relative to body size? Yeah, yeah, their brain's absolutely larger than like a one-ton Nile crocodile, and this animal weighed as much as like a bag full of hydrogen gas. That's that has a skeleton made of glass in it. Okay, James know. isn't James isn't doing the JP three thing of saying they're smarter than primates. He's just saying no. they're smarter than literal the, the literal pile of hammers that is a crocodile. I mean, no croc. No crocs are actually quite intelligent as well. I'm just saying, like, were these corvids or parrots? No, like that's pretty unambiguous. They weren't probably as intelligent as most modern birds but there's a pretty big gulf between most modern birds and crocodiles Mm -hmm. and i think it's totally fair to say that these animals could have inhabited that i bring this up only because i think there's a tendency to say they're not smart enough to be pack hunters and i don't think we have evidence of that um i think that the frequency of association of evidence of a lot of deinonychus at one tenontosaurus site which is otherwise a very rare thing in the fossil record. How do you to me, suggest well, like we don't have a lot of let's say ceratopsian sites in the Hell Creek that have a lot of T. Rex bones around them, mm-hmm. or even any other dromaeosaur that gets preserved like this. Like all of the Velociraptor fossils that we found have been solo. One was found with the Protoceratops. There's no evidence of another Velociraptor anywhere near there. Right. Now, that would be a unique burial circumstance. It's unlikely you'd find, like, the whole pack near the proto if they're being buried the way we think they're getting buried in the Gobi. But we don't even find, like, shed teeth that would indicate some sort of scavenging or other sort of hunting activity. It's only, to my knowledge, Deinonychus, and it happens all the time. There is a paper from 1995 uh, by um, Maxwell and Ostrom that reviews this, and this includes not only the Yale localities— but the Princeton localities in the Cloverly and the uh, Museum of the Rockies localities. And I'm going to quote from this paper. Um, Tenontosaurus is the most common element of the Cloverly fauna, and its remains were collected at 58 different sites in 103 localities. Deinonychus remains were found close to, or intimately associated with, Tenontosaurus remains at 14 of the 58 sites. Deinonychus material was only found at six sites that lacked Tenontosaurus remains. So there's a pretty remarkable tendency for these things to be found together. And they discuss two sites in particular. One is the Yale quarry that the, like, originally described Yale specimens of Deinonychus came from, which is associated with Tenontosaurus. And the other is a locality that yielded a complete Tenontosaurus skeleton that I've seen at the Museum of the Rockies. It's contorted. It's like its spine is all really, like, hunched. It's in a very weird posture. Hmm. Um, it seems to be a juvenile Tenontosaurus by my eyes, based on the size of it. It's MOR682. And it was found with, uh, let me get the number right here because I have the paper open, 11 Deinonychus teeth, which based on rates of tooth replacement and loss has been estimated at being uh, attributable to six to eight Deinonychus individuals feeding at the site, even if they're scavenging. I guess my point is just that I think if this were mobbing behavior, which is fairly common among reptiles, I feel like this is a kind of trend we would see more in the theropod fossil record. The fact that it's kind of unique to Deinonychus implies to me that there's some different mechanism driving it. Also, to put in perspective the size difference here, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Tenontosaurus off the top of your head. Uh, One of the main reasons why, or or not necessarily one of the main reasons, but one of the reasons that has been brought up for why Deinonychus would be pack hunting is Tenontosaurus is a big animal relative to, I mean, it's a big animal in general, but especially relative to Deinonychus. Um, this, This thing was like up to eight meters long. 
it was a pretty it, like 23 ish feet uh and it weight estimates have been have put it like up to two tons and for Deinonychus, it has been estimated to be like maybe at the biggest up to like a hundred kilo uh, kilos like like 210 pounds something like that something like big mountain lion size right yeah i mean this would be like a single mountain lion taking on a rhinoceros yeah in terms of relative sizes or something even bigger than a moose Mm -hmm. like that puts it more like i guess ecologically in comparison like right and like a a thing that i thought about which is like on you can't there's no way to test this it's just a thought that i've had um, but, like, I'm thinking about animals today that we know pack hunt in a coordinated way. So, like, cetaceans, wolves, lions. And then the next step down is, like, crocs. And there's such a gulf in intelligence, so to speak, between those two things. Like, do we really know where coordinated pack hunting started? At least, rel- based on what you guys have said so far. And, like, what I know about animals that pack hunt in, the, in a coordinated way. It seems like there's a huge gap between the coordinated things and the mob things. And I, I don't know, I just wonder, like, where is the threshold for coordination with intelligence? Because I feel like that's a spot on the intelligence spectrum, so to speak, that we just don't have in living animals. Because there is such a huge difference between birds, cetaceans, mammals, and crocs, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, Alex, what were you going to say? So crocodilians aren't, and this is maybe on my a bad on my part if I misspoke or was not clear. They are co- crocodilians do hunt, like they coordinate when they hunt. Oh, but they don't have tightly knit social groups like wolves, or lions, and they mm-hmm. murder and hate each other. Gotcha. And it's not the same as mobbing, as in Komodo dragons and other things. It's different. Define what you mean by by coordinate, because I think I know what I think I know what you're talking about. I mean, I've seen videos where like there will be groups of crocs and they seem to have an understanding of like which gazelle crossing the river they're going to go for and that the others will. So they don't interfere with each other when that happens. It it, like, that's something that I would call coordination, even if it's not cooperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, there's another aspect to this, um, Mm -hmm. which is, and, and, you know, crocodilians do exhibit parental care. Um, but like, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to assume some like some degree of parental care in Donaticus, given that we have reasonable evidence that it was an open nest, like an exposed nest animal, right? Eggs attributed to Donaticus or a Donaticus like animal. Analyses of the, the biomolecules in the shells revealed that they had colored pigments, and those are the same kind of pigments that we associate with open nests. So they weren't burying their eggs. So there was some degree of brooding. Um, and, and all of that, I think, implies a degree of, of social, not necessarily sociality, but certainly the capacity for a social, a degree of social intelligence that would allow for coordinated hunting in right. some fashion. And, and to address Amelia's point directly, I think, I mean, the only way to, that I can read the kind of distribution of really tightly coordinated, like highly social pack hunting in mammals is that it's all independent. Mm-hmm. But I'm not aware of any animal that currently exhibits what you might call, like, maybe cheetahs. Male cheetahs tend to live in, like, loose social, like, not a, really a loose social group, but they live in a coalition with their brothers for a while. But I don't think they hunt together, right? They do. They do. Okay. They do. But is it lion-like? Uh, yeah. I don't know if I would say lion-like in particular, but... Um, so like maybe hey, wildlife wire comment about this yeah well, you, wildlife, wildlife wire please tell us how we're wrong i'm not aware they, of they do ma- they do hunt coordinated right but it's not the same kind as like lions where like the individuals will have different placements and kind of like funnel the prey towards each other or like what wolves do where there's like division of labor is i guess what i'm getting at here i don't know right? i'm not sure if it's that far off well, I, I, which I, is also what cetaceans do Right, like uh, like orcas when they are hunting together, like they will, it's incredibly coordinated behavior on a scale that is unlike anything I've really ever seen otherwise. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I know that coyotes kind of have a very plastic social structure, and but like th that's mostly that like they'll change between being solitary hunters and being pack hunters, depending on the season and availability of food. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I just like I think it must be something that's quite labile. Okay. Right. Sorry. Like, hold on. Yeah. Go ahead. Um. So. Not a, so it, it's apparent coordination and collaboration, cooperative hunting and crocodilians, where the observations, uh, it, it's a summary article of what's anecdotal and what's not. But like, for example, they're talking about like having, having set crocodilians that are driving push schools of fish and like entrapping them and then like upset that weight and catch, hmm. Hmm. which I think that would satisfy collaborative. And then yeah. again, these are not animals that are have tightly knit like social groups and again cannibalize each other off like these are not health crocodiles yeah right and i mean like cannibalization is also present in almost every like carnivorous animal like lions do it i mean there's a social purpose purpose to it right like humans males do will... we're pretty social right well yeah i mean I think the idea that, oh no, these animals couldn't live in a group together because sometimes they kill each other is so effortlessly contradicted by all human behavior. Um, but like lions will kill any juvenile lions that are, belong to like, they're the offspring of different males, right? Mm -hmm. Because they want to like get the females back into the breeding cycle and they do that by killing their young. Um, it doesn't mean lions aren't highly social animals. I mean, crocodilians aren't. I'm not trying to imply that they are. If like, anything, they, they, I would say that that is social behavior. Yeah. Well, well, right, right. But, like, crocodilians don't seem, to our eyes at least, to form, like, social bonds with each other. They will live mm -hmm. in close contact with each other. There's some sociality, but, but it's not like a mammal. I feel like right. they have friends, though. Like, the, this is... And, and I think, you know, in that... Sure, the, the, the size of the brain relative to the brain cases. I'm sorry, to the body in something like a Nile crocodile. It's pretty substantial. Like caimans, like little guys with big heads. I, I, these, I think these brains are really. I mean, they're more. It's more of a croc than it is a mammal or even a crown. Like any crown. Like yeah. the development of the yeah. cerebrum is not. But I think if if we're if we're working off of available evidence for dynamicness, like I don't know that that kind of a wound seems pretty incredible to me. In that I've never seen literally anything else that has. I mean, do we know it's a real wound? Do we know it's not depositional or like taphonomic? The the claw is literally in the ossified tendons. I know, but it could be pushed in by other forces. I I think that's an incredible stretch. Listen, I agree. I, I, I gotta find I, it. Ooh, I, big I gotta stretch. I gotta find it. Yeah. Ooh, big stretch indeed. Ooh. I think we're stun locked on this sufficiently. Ooh. Yes. Um, yeah, that's fine. So and like is... to be clear, I was my point was just like, do we know when coordinated pack hunting evolved? Or like, at what threshold do you need? To... That's what I was. At. That's what I was opening. Yeah. So I'm glad no, we've talked about question. it in more detail. Yeah. Because it's yeah. like it's just for me an interesting thought of yeah. What what is the threshold the, of intelligence the... that you need to have that kind of behavior? The right. very and... last point that I uh, uh, that I want to make on this, anyways, is uh, again kind of the like it's come up many many times is that there is, to my knowledge, only one species of pack hunting birds. Yes, um, yeah. the yeah, I mean, Harris hawks. There are like collaborative. There's like collaboration. Yeah, I, it's. It, yeah. I mean, their sociality is incredibly complex. In a lot of it. But yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, so and like it's it's not like, uh, uh, so yeah, that that's all I'll t t say on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, listen, it, I'm not trying to argue that it's an extremely likely thing or that they had like a mammal-like social bonds necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe a crocodilian model is better than I thought because I I wasn't aware of the amount of collaboration that went into that. But Croc gang. right, I think the. What I'm responding to is that the alternative hypothesis has been this is a mob and they're mostly killing each other, mm -hmm. and I, I don't see. think okay. I, I, and I don't think that's what's going on. Which no, I, I think so was either. also brought up because of the several Deinonychus that have been found in association, like Deinonychus skeletons in association with Tenontosaurus. That either I've heard it before as either like 
it's evidence for pack hunting because one of the in, one or two of the individuals were killed in the process of taking down this much larger animal which if that's happening with like what is it like so many of the the hunts with Deinonychus that it's a significant a statistically significant portion of the fossil record these things are really bad pack hunters if they're losing three or four members of the pack every hunt well, um, so it's only it's only one of them where it's multiple body fossils. There's a okay. lot with so many shed teeth that there need to That's, have been more feeding. Yes, yes. Right. But but what I was going to say is, but that has been evidence for the other thing of that these things were feeding on a Tenontosaurus that they mobbed, and then in the process, through their reptilian bloodlust, they tore out the throats of their compatriots. Um... I, I would like to point the uh, all of our viewers and the authors of this paper to an image of a World War II plane with holes in it, which is... Um, Don't explain it. Want, Don't explain it. Are there shed if, teeth of Deinonychus in this plane? I've got... I'm, here's a radical thing for you guys, all right? Are you ready? To find them in the fossil record, they had to have died. What? I, Actually, that's not true. Ghosts? Are you talking about molts. a fossil? Oh my god! Okay, yeah, the these are all okay. molting. Dinonychus molting its skeleton. <laughs> right. Dinonychus <laughs> definitely did molt because it definitely had. Head in gang hours. Uh, didn't molt its skeleton though. It didn't turn inside out, grow new bones, right. and then re invert. Itself. How do you know that though? Yeah, do, yeah. I wasn't I there. Do you? There's a meme with like a trilobite uh, about this. It's like this. This guy died fossilized without dying. That's cheating. <laughs> insert ridley scott joke <laughs> how do you know you weren't there shut up nerd <laughs> yeah, right right ridley all scott i'm saying is this if you have any assemblage in the fossil record that shows multiple deinonychus with a tenontosaurus by definition those animals have died and so the <laughs> fact that they have died cannot then be used as evidence to determine how good they were at pack hunting if they were so good that none of them were ever killed in the hunt, we would never find fossil evidence that indicated that they were pack hunters. Whoa, hold on. That means a right. lot of dinosaurs were pack hunters because we don't find fossil evidence of them at all. They're all so good. <laughs> I am in agony. So I, I think it is just, again, I don't think that there is any reason to say that because occasionally there's mortality, it couldn't have been a pack hunt. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, occasionally, I'm sure, I've never seen, like, footage of it, but I'm sure some lion hunts go really poorly. Especially when they're... I, yeah. There's, well, like, I don't remember which documentary it is in particular, but there is one that shows, I believe, like, a lioness that basically had its jaw, like, destroyed. It's really yikes. bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, I've never seen this happen in particular, but I'm sure it has happened that, like, a group will go after a Cape buffalo, which is an animal that they hunt. And I think in terms of relative size, that's maybe a good illustration of Deinonychus after Tenontosaurus. I actually don't think so. I think that that's, that, I think that's, that's too small. too small of a gap, let me see. Right, but I mean, in terms of danger, right, at the very least, because Cape buffalo is such a dangerous animal, I'm sure there have been cases where multiple individuals in the pride have been killed by one buffalo. Even if they later take it down. Yeah, and like, like thinking about you know, how, how not, not scripted, that's not the right word, but how edited, like, lion hunts are in documentaries. Like, even if they, they sometimes will show one lioness get injured in some way. But that doesn't right. mean others are not also getting injured. Because a lot of the, like, the way documentary footage works, they're not always necessarily even following the same animal when they say they are. Like, that kind of stuff. And, like, I'm sure a lot of hunts are horrible in ways that they don't want to show necessarily because it might be interpreted I and mean, they wouldn't go over well if you show a documentary and like a lot of young kids watch documentaries um and young kids can take a lot of violence but i don't think parents would be too happy if there's one where like three or four lions are brutally gored by a buffalo before they finally right. the remainder finally take it down you know well right and i mean there's a reason that like wildlife documentaries for mass markets from africa never show wild dog hunts because, like, I've watched them and basically they just, it's like one bite to the groin and you instantly eviscerate the prey animal. And you get to watch it try to run away while all of its guts are spilling out and it's getting its feet tangled in its own intestines. It's the cycle and, of 
around. Right. Like, lions are at least good for the camera in that they try to suffocate their prey a lot of the time. <laughs> Which is, like, less That's... horrifically gory than what wild dogs do. I've seen a sing, and I do not, I cannot for the life of me remember which documentary it was, but I have like a vivid memory of a wild dog hunt being shown. And yeah, that was exactly what happened. Cause I remember it was really graphic and horrible. And I was like, Jesus Christ, that was. Yeah. No, and, and I mean, you know, at the time I was like, what? I don't know. Eight. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Okay. And, and cats tend to kill their prey before they start eating, which uh, wild dogs Not don't always. do. They tend to, that always, but but they, they tend to try to kill and subdue before they start feeding. Wild dogs, they just start eating. Dogs Why eat. wait? The dogs point gotta is, eat. They've got that dog in them. The point is, <laughs> you're still alive when they begin to eat. <laughs> oh, yes. look at Mr. Movie over here. Um, Indeed. <laughs> shall we continue talking about the design of this animal? <laughs> yeah, probably. Anyway, the end, the end result is this. No, uh, Scott, I've agreed with your segue request, but I, then I've declined it upon further review. <laughs> the point, Check off that bingo card, everybody. Yeah, the point is, I think, important to mention. We find only Deinonychus and Tenontosaurus in association with each other in a lot of these sites. It's not like there's a lot of different things. It's like those are the things you find. Cool. That indicates that there's a consistent association of the two. That means either that these animals preferentially scavenge Tenontosaurus or that they were hunting them together in some way. The portion of the debate that we focused on is whether they were like truly social animals or like they were more like crocodilians. But I think unless it's all happenstance scavenging, there has to be some degree to which they're working together to kill this. I just don't see a way around it. That's my, I've, I'm done. Refer to earlier in the video with the timestamp where I said I was right and then gave this answer, which was sort of. <laughs> also to- Note how much to... time has passed. <laughs> also, to to uh, finish up the whole like size difference thing with the lions and stuff, um, I I don't even really need to do the full ratios because Tenontosaurus has been estimated to weigh double a Cape buffalo, and oh. uh, <laughs> uh, Deinonychus has been estimated to weigh less than half a lion. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> so they need help. They need all they the need help they can get to hunt help. these animals. Oh my God. Are you okay, Dalton? Some electronic thing. It just went like glu -glu 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 in the house. I don't know what it was. <laughs> it's a jerk. I don't know what it was. I don't know what I it's own. The that, drone. That's... <laughs> that scared the <laughs> shit out of me. And it wasn't even a scary sound. It was, was it in the basement or was it in the apartment? It sounded right behind me. Maybe it's the room. <laughs> You oh, talked no. about communists and the FBI agent who listens to our <laughs> recordings <laughs> accidentally left it. He, he unmuted himself for a second there. So, Deinonychus, what it looks like. This Not creature this. right here. So, James said a, a business week ago that... <laughs> That's that, pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that a lot of the design of this animal is relatively spot on to the Bakker reconstruction of Deinonychus from 1969. Unfortunately for the design of the animal in this game, a couple years have passed between current year and 1969. I... I'm, I looked at that illustration. The original, the Bakker one also looks much better. It does. It does because Bakker's really, good really artist. good paleo artist. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, so what has changed about Deinonychus in the years since 1969 that would influence how this animal looked? Found a few more of them. We did find a few more. We did learn that the shoulder girdle did not connect directly to the pelvis and that that's actually a coracoid we also um, learned um it looks like the shoulder is. it looks like the shoulder girdle of this model almost connects yeah. directly to the pelvis because it's yeah. so skinny emaciated and gross that the the <laughs> scapula almost like merges especially when it drinks there look at that 
Mm. It goes right back and touches Must it. I? It's oh disgusting. I see an open groove where a scapula should be. It's like it's concave. It's like, this the, is... it's like the, the people whose like sternums are kind of like Im- yeah. depressed. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Pectus excavatum. This makes me depressed. <laughs> yeah, um, and the scapula itself is depressed. Um, as Alex said, we've also learned what a dromaeosaur looks like. <laughs> now, notably, I know that the the we didn't have a lot of cranial material for Deinonychus, especially when that reconstruction was made. So the skull of that reconstruction is kind of more generic carnosaur than well, we... Scott, I'm going to contradict you for a second. We actually did have a lot of the skull. It was uh, assembled to look like a general carnosaur, but a lot of it is there. Okay, correction on that. It Between... looked in the model general carnosaur mm-hmm. Yes. And yeah. now we've... I've personally seen a whole lot of different reconstructions of Deinonychus giving it a whole lot of different head shapes Mm. and I don't know if there is more of a consensus on what this thing's head would have looked like yes Scott you're correct (laughs) ignore the weird (laughs) pause Um, so there are kind of there are tree my riddle's tree and James said earlier that there's like it's like yeah there's actually a lot of the skull which is also sort of true like not really. It's between three individuals, we have a rough idea, but like not enough in that we're not about to talk a little bit about how there are several competing interpretations of this thing's skull. Well, right. I, missing... I do think all the cranial material comes from one specimen, though. It's it's all. I thought it was all supposedly one individual. No. Oh no! Different numbers. Never mind. Yeah. Here we go. I yep. scanned all that. So don't don't you doubt. Don't you come at me. A lot of it is 5210, though. Yes, a lot of it is 5210. But there's, yeah. there's there's some other stuff. So, like, the nice maxilla is a separate specimen. Um, right, which is a problem. Anyway. Um, so, yeah, there's there's tooth-bearing elements. There's much of a mandible. Uh, there's a fair about amount of a palate. Um, but we're also, you know, we're missing a lot of the skull roof. And we're, we don't have a brain cage, which is kind right. of... Uh-oh. I have a question. Now, yes. no, now back up a second. Y'all have been talking a lot about the relative size of the brain to the body, and we don't have a brain case? There are, I, I believe there are Deinonychus brain cases. But I mean, Maybe I'm talking, are. I believe there are. No, I think there are MOR Maybe stuff. recently. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, that might, yeah not, 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 not in the Peabody material. No, no not okay. in the Peabody material. Okay. But also, like, I'm, I'm talking about dromaeosaurs. Like, we, we have many dromaeosaur brain cases. They have, lo- okay. like, for this... To be as l- relatively brainless as a crocodile, its brain case would have, would have been like it's the size of a thimble suspended in a giant like floating soup of jaw musculature. The Dune space spice navigator. I'm not saying thing. crocs are stupid, but I'm saying like for body mass, you would need an amazingly small brain on dinosaurs. But yes, I think the critical thing about the skull profile being uncertain is that we don't have a skull roof and we don't have the ventral ramus of the lacrimal. So we don't have a lot of controls on the skull height or the curvature of the top of the skull. Yes, and that's where a lot of the, um, I, I think kind of the two major places that, that a lot of these skull reconstructions differ is there's this classic, like, very ugly one. Um, and then there's kind of a more recent one that kind of came around in the 90s where the snout is longer and kind of lower, but it still has this high temporal region. Um, which you see in a lot of museum ah. specimens and stuff. Mm-hmm. I was going to say that's like the, the AM and H one is like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that one. Um, there are issues with this one, as I found last time I looked at the model, uh, to my, much to my surprise, um, which is that the, the, the pterygoid, uh, the, the quadrate ramus of the pterygoids in specimens reconstructed like that do not contact even like come close to contacting the pterygoid ramus of the quadrate. And, I, ah. and, and that, so that orientation, like the orientation of the quadrates and probably much of the posterior palate and skull are a little off. Um, so yeah, there's variation in that kind of temporal region where the elements are known and also in the uh, front of the snoot into some fun mysteries with the uh, premaxilla and the maxilla. Right. So, yeah, there's that one, and then there's been a more longirostrin. 
reconstruction. Um, but there are also, uh, I guess we can kind of tie this into phylogenum. We, yeah, I did, mean, I... I let, let's, let's just do... If anyone else has anything they want to say about reconstructions before we do that. Well, I, I could tie it into phylogenum with talking about powers and stuff, but if anybody else has something to say, go ahead now. That's a good segue. Say your... Yeah, well, what is, let's let anybody else go first, and then I'll say that. I don't think I have anything Deinonychus to say, but I do have this this great little man. Hello, man. Hello, naked. little man. He's naked. He gets to be naked now. Hooray. <laughs> Hooray. Dalton got Hooray. to wear in pajamas. Was, uh, um, anyways, continue. That that was my point. Yeah. I'm done now. Um, so, it, 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 well, I, I guess my question is, like, is, is this going to fully wrap up our conversation about the looks of this animal, or are we going to come back? I, I think I, I have if, to come back. It, yeah, I think if we've got okay. a dangling okay. thread, we can come back to it. Yeah, um, we have a couple, namely the the claw, the legs, and the tail. Sure. So, um, namely, namely the, the, the all rest of, of the animal. I also um, kind of want to talk about the hands. Oh yeah, yeah, the hands, the hands and the arms. The yeah. rest of the okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so. Alex mentioned that in the 90s, the interpretation of Deinonychus started to become more of a longer rostrum, kind of shallow mm -hmm. snouted. Longer rostrum. Nobody in our audience knows why we say that word that way. But we all <laughs> We're know. We're never going to explain it. <laughs> no, we won't. Um, but Focus. this really comes, I think, a lot from Greg Paul's Predatory Dinosaurs of the World. And you can see that inferred skull shape in the Jurassic Park character model for Velociraptor. Not in this game, really, where I think they've gotten the crappy Jurassic World redesign of it. But, like, a lot of the, like those character models were mostly based on Greg Paul's illustrations of Deinonychus, where he interpreted it as having originally been something much more Velociraptor-like in profile. And so this idea that it was a long, low snap came from there. Um, and I just think that's an important note that... Generally speaking, interpretation of Deinonychus in like the 90s or late 80s, as Scott asked a while ago in a thread we've abandoned by the roadside, um, never to return. But I'm going back briefly to look at it and say that's that thread we abandoned and then go back away from it. Um, is that it looks like what the Jurassic Park Velociraptor looked like because the Jurassic Park Velociraptor is, for all intents and purposes, Deinonychus as understood in the late 80s, early 90s. Yes. Like... It's Deinonychus. It, it's just Deinonychus. That's how they designed it. We said this a year ago, roughly, when we <laughs> talked about Velociraptor on this channel, and we said, it's just Deinonychus. It's just Deinonychus. Um, anyway, I would say that to some degree, that's really where interpretation of Deinonychus's anatomy had kind of stopped. Um, you'd see various takes on how long a rostrum it should be, and whether the snout was upturned at the end, like Velociraptors, or whether it was a more right. kind of smoothly sloping but long snout. But then, friend of the channel, Mark Powers, did something radical, which was... Actual he's friend a, of the channel this time. Actual friend of the channel, yes. He's yes. not a war criminal. He is a good friend. <laughs> yes. Are we sure uh, about that? Uh, Are you sure? I am sure about that. He's Canadian. There are no Canadian war criminals, right? Insert montage of Canadian war criminals. They can't claim it if we sing it. Oh. Anyway, no. Mark there's Powers. A whole, is, there's a whole Wikipedia article about it. <laughs> okay, anyway. I'm sure. <laughs> flippant joke about Canadians being nice, notwithstanding. Mark Powers is not a war criminal and is a very and nice man nice. And, and a friend of the channel and a good scientist. And <laughs> what he did was segment a CT scan of the um, of YPM5232, which is that really well preserved kind of nasal and maxilla complex. It's actually got a little bit of the palate on it too. And I know. And he found something very interesting when he did that, which is that the anterior region of the snout that had been interpreted as a broken maxilla that indicated a much longer maxilla was actually the back half of the premaxilla. The suture is really difficult to see on the fossil specimen, but it's really obvious in CT section. 
Um, and he also found that the back part of the top ascending part of the maxilla that goes over the interorbital fenestra is actually the lacrimal. And so these things combined led Mark to reinterpret this skull of Deinonychus as having been much shorter in profile and boxier, um, kind of like what we now think Sauronothelestes looked like. Um, so a much shorter, boxier type of skull than what a Velociraptor in Dromaeosaur would have. And that's relevant to phylogenum, and I'm taking the phylogenum stick now. No. <laughs> and I've taken it from you, Alex. No. You get to be right about it's crocodile probably a sort of hunting, but at what cost? <laughs> well, Alex, you say that, but our analyses don't recover that result. I know. I don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a sort of lusty. I think I would be surprised if it's within Sornothelestians because that group exists about like 25 million years later. To be deeply nested within them, it would be a little odd. Yeah. Um, but in fairness, that's... Sister. Yeah, I could believe it's sister as like an early member of a North American type lineage. Because um, the same problems you just outlined are also <laughs> evident in our topology where it's a whole deeply nested in philosopher yes no 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 i'm not i'm not saying that i necessarily believe our topology over that i this is just for deinonychus we believe the rest of it though yeah let well be, i mean let, be, let us listen be clear. to get deinonychus into a like more quote-unquote reasonable position our own analyses like you can go to the Kuru paper and look at this we'll put the figure of the phylogeny from the Kuru paper on screen right now to move deinonychus out of being a derived velociraptor you need to move it one step on the phylogeny that is a very normal, right? That is a very normal kind of thing for a taxon to do in a new analysis. Um, it is the result of our analysis. Like this isn't us theorizing where we think Deinonychus goes. We know where we think it probably goes, but based on the current sample of characters that we're working with and the current set of observations, that's the answer we get in our runs. Right. Um, we're doing more work on the problem. We think it's probably going to move as we do that, but you know, those are the results our data set derives. At this point, um, Mark Powers' analysis in parsimony finds Deinonychus to be the outgroup to Sornithelestian dromaeosaurs, just like what Alex said. So Sornithelestians are the shorter snouted, more robust dromaeosaurs compared to Velociraptor. They're only currently known from North America. So it would make sense for Deinonychus as a North American one to be kind of, you could think of it as a distant uncle of that group. Um, and? Short. And short snouted, right, which which we do now know about. Um though, in the Bayesian in his Sorry, Bayesian yeah. trees, it doesn't go there though. It comes up in a polytomy with like all of Dromaeosauridae. Where there's subgroups resolved, but we don't know where Deinonychus goes. Oh yeah, and I mean like some of the other positions, not the ones we're discussing now, do get it as kind of a basal eudromaeosaurus. Right. And I would I don't think that that's unreasonable, that it is something that's kind of more basal than where we have a good fossil record. And so it tends to alternate between clades to belong to, even though it doesn't really belong to either of them. Like, sure. you know, if if it's more basal than the origin of those groups. Um, have you considered? No. Have I considered what? It's a sort of the... I've decided. Okay. It, it may as well be. I mean, it, I certainly wouldn't not believe it. Um, it's just worth noting that it's about 110 million years old, and the oldest Sornithelestian that we know of is, like, 75. Oh, so it fills in a ghost lineage. Uh, yeah, a really long one. It goes one step in there. I don't, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, I, and I mean, I also, it just, the, my, my defiant certainty that it is a Sornithelestian is a bit of a, a gag. Right. Um, because it's worth pointing out that uh, very recently it was just discovered that Shri has apparently convergently evolved a short-snouted uh, morphology amongst Velociraptor, which are generally considered to be long, low. Right. So, so now, you know, it's a, it's a plastic thing. Right. It, I mean, exactly. It, you know, it is true that all of the Sornithelestians we know about right now have a short snout, but it being short-snouted does not necessarily mean it has to be that. And so that's the phylogenum. Um, we don't really know where Deinonychus goes. It is a dromaeosaur. Um, it is a fairly well understood dromaeosaur anatomically, but dromaeosaurs are so rare and their fossil record is so spotty that it is actually remarkably difficult to reconstruct confident phylogenies for the group. It's a um, eudromaeosaur. It's a eudromaeosaur as well. It's more derived than Microraptorids. Um, 
But within that group, you've really only got good fossil material for a select handful of species. It's a tough area of the tree. Um, I note in the Kuru paper, um, me and Alex know. But well, I, mean, I you probably wrote this. I, I wrote the, I wrote these words. I remember sitting so in my office writing this. them. I, I noted this specifically <laughs> um, that the entire clade of Tremaeus of Eutremaeus Oridae can basically collapse one step out. The Brammer support is one. Um, you need to change remarkably little about the tree to get most of the relationships to fall apart. It's an area that we're actively working on um, because it's worthy of study, and we want to understand the evolution of this like of this group. Um, but it's a tough problem. And so yeah. Alex and I think we'll have an answer hopefully fairly soon, but yeah, in 20 to 30 years, right. <laughs> Tail end of our career watch in our 30th space. anniversary video. Yeah. Watch this space. We're, we're very slowly creeping toward Bethlehem. They're going to, God, they're going to discover some technology that makes it look like 500. Put it, put it in, they're going to watch the video and be like, he wouldn't like this. And I'm, I'm going to be like, all right, well, I'm 300. We tried it again. Now it's three steps. There's been no change in phylogenetic methodology in three in three centuries. Right. It, it's what more fun. you have after 300 years. Parsimony was right all along. I'll have you, Dynamic. <laughs> I'll have you. Anyway, Scott, why don't you say something else about this model? Cool. Absolutely, I will. Um, moving down the body, uh, its arms and hands are gross, twig-like, malformed, and terrible. <laughs> it's um, got, like, the, na- the claws are, like, I... It has tiny little witchy hands and little peg-like arms that, like, look like they were made of twigs and silly putty. It's, like, this is one of the worst examples of... Um, you'll, you'll often hear, uh, uh, paleo fanatics, uh, talking uh, or bemoaning the fact that, uh, so many, (laughs) that so many, uh, depictions of dinosaur, uh, of theropods have them with these little bunny hands sort of things. Like you see on the, on this guy and the Jurassic Park Velociraptor and stuff. When in reality, they would not have held their hands in that posture. Uh, they would have held them facing each other. Uh, like you see on a lot of the other dromaeosaurs in this game, or a lot of the other dinosaurs in this game. They're actually pretty good about that in a lot of other critics. Yeah. Um, and notably, um, it's how the Atrociraptors in uh, Dominion uh, hold their hands. That not only would these guys have, like, not done this, but, like, their hands are so tiny on this model, it's weird it's terrible that deinonychus had really really big hands uh because like a lot of what what alex no i no we have to cut the joke oh um because of like a lot of dromaeosaurs they were using those hands for grasping and holding on to prey possibly even uh holding on to trees and stuff and climbing up trees and all this crazy stuff. Um, But also for attachment points for the feathers that they definitely had. Um, These guys had big long arms and they had big long hands and all of those arms and hands would have had feathers all down them um, like what we see in the animal that we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Utah Raptor. The absolutely stunning model in this game that gets the feathers about as good. right as I've yeah. ever seen them done. Like, they're great. No, they're very um, yeah, they're great. I, I don't mean to undermine that. But no, good. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, arms and hands, terrible, awful. The body, shrunken and misshapen. Weird and barrel-shaped and just short and collapsed. Um... What about uh, let let's take take a little look, uh, Dalton. If you could possibly engage Pervert Cam oh, on uh, one that is walking on it's not Cam. some grass, so we can take a look at that eponymous. Oh, can, so terrible. Can you update eight. Update eight should have um, the uh... updated Pervert Cam mechanic. <laughs> no, <laughs> it should have the Tarant- Tarantino Cam. Tarantino Cam. 
Engaging Tarantino cam. Yeah, walk through the mud. He's so grass. it's 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 a little tough to see here, but honestly, I think that mm, from looking at it, I don't think the killing claw is actually all that bad. You just made like an enemy awareness alert sound. With your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, I just make video game sound effects every yeah. once in a while. Scott does foley for video game companies. He's like that guy from Spaceballs. Um, the claw is dramatically undersized considering the keratin sheath, but I think morphology-wise... Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Considering the keratin sheath, like, if this was just the naked ungules, I don't think it's awful, but... Consider the keratin wait, sheath. Consider the keratin <laughs> sheath, and it would have been significantly larger than this. Consider, if you will, the keratin, <laughs> the keratin, keratin, keratin sheath. sheath. Consider the humble keratin sheath. <laughs> what, what about this, the social... The social dynamics of the Deinonychus. And oh. these young Deinonychus, and they are in such a difficult place in their lives. <laughs> what we're really saying is uh, this that's Deinonychus the, that's needs... That's the cruel thing right there. This Deinonychus needs to clean its and they just And they say you're not supposed to cry, but damn you, I'm a human too. <laughs> anyway, that's just a character we made up. That's not a real person. Up yours, woke phylogeneticist. We'll see who repositions you within sort of the Lestines who. Oh god, there are so many annoying people who are like, oh, he's very serious. You have to take him seriously. And I'm like, I don't know. And they're always like, you have to watch all all the videos that Deinonychus makes. And I'm like, no, I don't. I'm right. (laughs) And I refuse to do more work about this. And constantly, I'm constantly supportive. Do okay, you think that okay. Deinonychus ever fell into a coma because it refused to eat anything other than Tenontosaurus? <laughs> well, they they did it, only eat red meat, so... It drank a bit well, of water, and it had to be... Oh, that's the sociality. That's it the was, ones that died. It was died. nursed back to life by its its daughter. <laughs> okay, okay. To, to make a real point here for a second... <laughs> sure, go ahead. Um, uh, upon, upon looking more closely on Tarantino cam... Uh, is the Halix reversed on this? I think it's going in the wrong direction. I, it is. I can't. See anything. Uh-huh. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. That that first that first claw there is pointing back. Oh my god! And it definitely shouldn't. Oh. Yeah. Let me go to the other side. I don't like that. Yep. Look at that. Oh my it's, god! It's Why? Backwards. I love so, it when my one so, my one finger is just rotated 180 <laughs> degrees relative to the other ones. Now is that I'm curious, is that perhaps like a an error in design from the original Jurassic Park Velociraptors, or do they get it mostly right there? I mean I'll, I gotta find out now. Breed one. Yeah. Alright, let's see. I would bet good money that this thing's correct. Is this the original JP one? I guess it's a random one. I think. Oh, I think it. No, I think it's just no. a, a brown uh, Jurassic World one. <sighs> Gross. Well, then I'll have to read an original one. I, I don't think the models change di- like dramatically, do they? What do you mean, Tarantino cam? It's also oh, no, backwards. that's backwards. Well, okay, I'm gonna try. They're not like that in the movie, are they? Let me try one of the like. Let me look. Uh, crap. Um, how do I control this game? It's just 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 just. I'll try just one of the um, one of the movie skins. Which one should I try? I, I think they might all work off the base same base model, but let me try the uh, female JP3 yeah. one. It's not reversed in the movie animatronic. Are oh, you looking at like the foot scene where it's like running through the uh, kitchen? Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 Absolutely correct. So it's a goof on in, as, yeah. In the, in so the it's a, it's a model it's like, goof. Well, are there any now, is it, there any it, footage of the Jurassic World ones? Feet? Is it a goof from the movie or the game? I refuse to look for the feet of that one. Unfortunately, I, I just can't emotionally do it. You won't have it sully. The other one, I don't mind if it's in my history, but that one, right? This one's also okay. reversed. I think. Yeah, it is. It um, might just be yep. a consequence of this game model. It's weird. It's worth noting that a reversed Halix is a trait of, that a lot of birds do have. Yes. All birds? So Question mark? 
another Most great many alien birds. feature. <laughs> right. But it's it, not, no, it's not one they should have. <laughs> it's not a reversal of the claw in the toe. It's the actual toe swings all the way around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. No, this is supremely cursed. Yeah. No, so that claw would have also faced backwards like the claws of the weight bearing toes. Um, so it's face it's, forwards. Well, the tip would be pointing backwards on the foot. Right. Okay. Right, that's what I mean. It would have been in the same orientation as all the other claws. The rest of them, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, I I interrupt this moment while Dalton plays with Pervert Cam to say I just opened my copy of Jurassic Park to a random page. It's actually the dual copy that's both of them. Mm-hmm. And I found the answer to Amelia's question about the frog DNA. Oh, and okay. Literally the first piece of text I looked at in the sequel. Are you ready? Uh, email from somebody to Henry Wu. Isolated glycogen synthase kinase 3 from Xenopus may work better than mammalian GSK3 alpha beta currently in use. Anticipate more robust establishment of dorsoventral polarity and less early embryo wastage. Oh, cool. Huh. So it's just the Laura thing. They were just tinkering until they got a result that was able to survive and they decided to use more Xenopus DNA. Hmm. That's fun. I mean, I that's like that. not directly related to whatever gene is causing them to be able to reproduce, I don't think. But I think that's this idea about why you're using all this different stuff. And that's an interesting, that's interesting because it's directly about like the thing I remember perhaps most about Xenopus or like the, the cool thing about it is in the embryos, you can tell really early which side is up and which side is down. Hmm. Like that's the whole point. That's really cool. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, I think it's a, it's a cool example of where like Michael Crichton's actual scientific knowledge was like really concentrated. Um, Man, it, that book's it, so good. Sorry. Yeah. Cold take. Uh, I also, the, yeah, cold take. The, I don't know. This is a very daring opinion for the skeleton crew, but I think Jurassic Park is pretty good. Yeah. I'm a Jurassic really Park. Clone good, Star actually. Fan myself. Um, There's also a quote from the beginning of the first novel that I think really sums up Deinonychus here. Yeah. Um, it, I'm going to paraphrase. Deinonychus is abhorrent because of its cold body, pale color, cartilaginous skeleton, filthy skin, fierce aspect, calculating eye, offensive smell, harsh voice, squalid habitation, and terrible venom. Wherefore, their creator has not exerted his powers to make many of them. <laughs> Incredible. What is this actually describing? It, it's, a... The phrase is, reptiles are abhorrent because yeah. of their cold... It's from Linnaeus. Linnaeus. Yeah. That uh, is oh, so, so funny. And that is <laughs> perfectly... Wrong. That perfectly encapsulates this critter. Yeah. yeah. Like, except for the fact of its calculating gaze, uh, th- there is... Th- there's no this calculation thing, here. <laughs> there's the only zero calculation. The only calculation is like the meme of the woman trying to do math. Like that's it. <laughs> there's not not except no progress it, is being made. Except it's this thing trying to breathe. Would you <laughs> would you find folks like to learn learn a cool thing? Yes. Cool fact. Hey, I'm here um, I was looking fact. up Blue's character model from Jurassic World because I did want to know if Jurassic World is the reason why this claw is reversed. Uh, mm-hmm. It just doesn't have one. Oh, we love it, folks. Are you oh my the God. the ankle blues like the the like ankle joint and the the top of the foot for blue is so narrow. It's like kind of comically narrow. Yeah. Um, and there's just not they enough. Gotta know that blues a lady will give a stiletto feet. There's just not enough room. Um, oh, but hang on, wait, wait. That character model says one thing but this is a gif from the film a filmic gif and it does seem to show a a reversed hallux so it may Mm. have been something that they did add to the like new models for velociraptors when they made jurassic world let me see yeah it's hard to it's hard to tell because i'm looking head on at the animal but it looks like it's uh looks like it's reversed so hmm that's just a weird thing they did. Do we owe the good folks of Frontier an apology for our incorrectness? I don't know. They, I think they owe us an apology for making this. I agree. Scott, didn't you want to say something about the tail? Yeah, it's gross and rat-like. <laughs> yeah. um, and has a weird fin on it. But mainly, uh, 
it is the second part of this critter's name, and it, it does bear some mention. Um, I, I would actually say not necessarily based on anything in this game, uh, but it is a common trend that I've seen in a lot of paleo art, too, because of the description of ossified tendons um, and the name being counterbalancing. Um, in reference to that tale, to depict Deinonychus in particular, but Dromaeosaurs generally, as basically having tails that almost look like broomsticks that are coming out of their butts, that um, they that they were that they have a stick up their ass. Um, right, it was like kind you of stuck like, a plunger onto your own ass and then have exactly. right. Well, oh, like like it, actually, it, like unironically, like that one study from a while ago where they just stuck plungers on the butts of chickens to see if it made them walk like dinosaurs, and it did. Um, uh, I believe that got an Ig Nobel Prize, but um, as it deserved, as it deserved. I love the Ig Nobel Prize. It was founded like two blocks away from where I live. Um, but so. Um, uh, that basically as, as kind of showing this tale as like an immobile rod and that has proven to be not the case um, in that there is a velociraptor specimen that James could probably note the specimen number of off the top of his head MPC-109 I'm sorry MPC-D 100 slash 986 Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, that is an, a fully articulated velociraptor tail that is shown in a very, um, a very strong kind of S curve, like sine wave sort of look and yeah. uh, orientation. And it is notable that like that is not pathologic. That's not broken. That it seems to be a life orientation that this was fossilized. So yes, and it's it's worth pointing out it's not just the it's like a lot not the interior coddles it's like the the meaty middle coddles which would be covered in ossified tendons and dinosaurs. Yeah. So these tails, while they were stiffened, um, they would not have been as inflexible as is often shown. So in that way. Um, this model actually, I guess, kind of sort of does get another point because like while they are showed uh, shown as stiffened, they are still able to be kind of like moved. So I guess it, a, a begrudging last point given that is immediately counteracted by the <laughs> fin that's on it. Now, correct me if, if are they super wiggly in like the media in, in the movie or like the uh they're real wiggly in the in the movie the but i i think a lot i th yeah i think a lot of that is possibly due to the fact that like at Not least it. in some shots they were like Rubber. models and they were literal like physical practical things that just kind of sure. wiggled around on the backs of um people who were in the suits which is funny I think. but like okay yeah. This is Yeah, I mean I have a I have a bone to pick with the animation of tails in Jurassic World movies in particular as well, because the animators do not properly reflect that the tail is integrated into the like into the leg musculature and plays a role in locomotion. Mm -hmm. It just flops and flaps around. Um but that uh, is a battle I'll save for another day. I have well, nothing kind to say about this animal, but I would be ready to rank it if other people are. I want to... Oh, um, I've sorry, I'm just trying to look something up really quickly. Because they're... Dalton trying to learn... This coloration in particular has accidentally, like, stumbled upon the John Civic. I believe it's his art, uh, Paleo Art of Dononicus attacking the mm. Dinosaurus. It's like a very classical Paleo Art piece of kind of a blue-backed, cream, oh. underbelly Dinonychus. I think that's totally by accident because the default skin is like that ugly maroon. Um, yeah, I'm ready to rank it. Everybody ready to rank it? I would yes. like this video to be done. Um, oh, I have I have fantastic news, by the way. Um, yeah. The Jurassic World Velociraptors do have a correct first digit. They do? 
Okay, yes. then it was a weird there angle. Is, yeah, there is one single frame I'm going to throw up here because I just screenshotted it. Um, the f*** is right. that? Sorry. <laughs> Are you playing a mobile was game? you who, who made no. the sound <laughs> that scared Paul? Uh, no, it wasn't. Your drum. It did sound like that, kind of. At long last, gentlemen. A game full of pretty mediocre designs and great designs has been truly undermined by kung fu treachery. I should have known you'd be behind this fiendish Dr. Wu. Your knowledge of scientific biological transmogrifications is only outmatched by your zest for kung fu treachery. Fiendish Dr. Wu, you done f***ed up now! <laughs> So are we officially introducing Fiendish Dr. Wu as F tier? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, in that so, case, Amelia, why don't you uh, take it away? It's terrible. It's the worst. It's, I remember, like, yeah, the first time playing the first game and thinking, what, what is this? Why is it so bad? And it was part of one of the campaigns. Like, you had to have them in one of them. And it's like, why did you have to, first of all, kick me down by introducing this and then continue to stab me by making it part of the campaign. It's just annoying and ugly and bad. And like my problem with the, the spec soft tissue, like a lot of people might think I don't like speculative soft tissue and that's correct. I tend to not. But... <laughs> <laughs> that's great. But that said, I appreciate it when it is inf either informed by the fossil record or made to look good and cool and aesthetically pleasing. And this is a case where like, yeah, this is technically possible, but why bother if you're not even gonna make it look good? If you're gonna make like cool speculative soft tissue, make it actually cool. Like the only exception to make it ugly is if the fossil record actually preserves it as ugly. Like that's it, that's your one one reason. Otherwise, like, isn't that the whole fun of speculating in paleo art to make things that look cool? Like you can cut this if you want. Everybody jokes, in my opinion, that the cool part of spec is that we're introducing the public to new ideas. That's a lie. You're making it look cool. That is the point. Um, and that is okay. That's what art is. It's fun. Um, this is not fun. This is bad. It doesn't look good. There's no point. You want to make it look like a rooster, I guess? Well, okay, then make it look like a rooster and give it a comb. That's at least spiky and kind of cool, and you could make it floppy. Um, the tail fin, there's, like, no excuse for, unless you make it aquatic and I don't know. It's not. Why would it? It just. I hate it. I hate it so much. I I mostly like most of these designs, and I really don't give a if they're accurate or not, as y'all know by now. I think, according to our stats, I our, our stats guy. I forget your name, and I'm sorry. Thanks, I'm bad stats guy. Name. Thank Adam you, Olos. stats guy. Adam Adam Olos. Thank you, Adam Olos. Uh, for doing fun stats with our rankings. I believe I am either the most or second most positive member of the crew in terms of rankings. The most. I am the most, yes, because I generally don't care as long as it looks fun. This doesn't. It's bad. Terrible. It's F. That's uh, bad. Get looks yeah. very bad. Very bad. Very, very bad. Um, I, I we've talked a lot about how we don't like this design, and I don't want to reiterate everything here, but I will just say I think it, it is coloring my perspective a little bit that there's a lot of tension in the Jurassic world era of the franchise between science and the depiction of the animals in the media. Um, I don't think it's bad for there to be artistic license and like brand consistency and canon consistency, but I also really wish that there had been more of an effort to interface with science and try to integrate what we know about dinosaurs into the designs of these animals before the last movie. Um, I, I think that given that context, it strikes me as a particular kick in the face to have Deinonychus, one of the most important dinosaurs ever discovered, right? Because this animal ignited ideas about dinosaurs being warm-blooded, the bird origin, or the theropod origin of birds, um, the dinosaur renaissance, that is what has led to the proliferation in dinosaur research that gave us all jobs. To have this particularly be the dinosaur that you make objectively the worst and ugliest in the entire game feels a little bit like the designer of this animal saying F you scientists i will do what i want and i don't like that 
Um, it's something I'm very happy that this game is moving away from in its DLC. Um, tomorrow night, we're going to be recording an episode about the DLC that's going to come out before this episode because our schedules are hell on earth. Um, yeah. But, you know, that that DLC has wonderful scientifically informed designs for its animals. It's, you know, this is something that's really specific to this design. This is a dinosaur I avoid in my parks at all costs, and I hate it uh, with every fiber of my being. I grant it no points and wish God will have mercy on its designer's soul. F tier. <laughs> This creature came into my house, pissed on my couch, kicked my dog, and stole a package off my porch. I hate it with every fiber of my being. And one of, if not my biggest disappointment with Jurassic World Evolution 2 is that they didn't entirely, completely from the ground up change how Deinonychus looked and just take a mulligan on it and just go, my bad, we're leaving the the old shitty one back in the first game. I cannot fathom how it was come to that this is what this creature will look like. I understand the practicality of the issue of, hey, we want to include Deinonychus in this game, and we want to make it look different from Velociraptor, which is Deinonychus. Part of me thinks it would be really funny if they put, like, a scientifically accurate but featherless D Velociraptor in the game and just called it Deinonychus, <laughs> like, like the one in, uh, like, the 2000 Disney Dinosaur. But I've seen, like, and I know that that is a huge issue. But this is not the solution. I know that uh, Fred the Dinosaur Man did a really interesting, uh, like, speculative version of how you could make a Deinonychus that looked and behaved different enough that you could make them not be confused for uh, this and Velociraptor not be confused for each other. And it was a really fun, interesting design. It wasn't this. I cannot stand this animal and uh, I condemn it for its crimes and it shall go in F tier. Awesome. It's your turn. No, it's you. Oh, no, you're oh, already... that, my, my oh, whole gag. Okay. All right. Well, I, I, I did. I've I've spoken my piece on this, but I will. Pro I will just a few quick things. One, um, and just to build off James's criticism, um, I think yeah. Beyond it being ugly, beyond it being kind of offensive to the importance of Dinonychus, like this was just kind of. It could have been an opportunity for them to be like, here's a nice retro. Anonica, like a nice retro dromaeosaur design that's maybe like something does something and they're like hey we're gonna we're gonna give you something worse than the original illustration of this thing in the set in like 69 uh two it is the mask of the red death it shows up to a cool party and kills vincent price and i won't stand for it and i award it an f i think one other one other thing needs to be said regarding Deinonychus and inspiring the dinosaur renaissance and how this kind of feels like this poor quality and just kind of wretchedly produced thing <laughs> is not only that doesn't only feel like an affront to kind of the, the entire progress of dinosaur science since the the 1960s but we wouldn't have jurassic park without the dinosaur renaissance ideas mm -hmm. of the dinosaur renaissance books produced by people who were coming into the field at that time, this revolution in what we understood about dinosaurs is in part what in, not only inspired Jurassic Park, but allowed Michael Crichton to write Jurassic Park in a way that the animals were considered new and scary and interesting. We wouldn't have the franchise without Deinonychus. Despite the fact that it's Velociraptor in the movies, like we wouldn't have it without Deinonychus. And to decide, oh, let's include it now and, and make it, the lowest quality of the designs and and i mean the texturing is ugly mate i'll give it a point that i think it's a well executed texture despite it being ugly like i don't like it but they did a good job putting all these little bumps and grooves i i bear no ill will to the artist because i i can only imagine this was designed by committee and by someone who was like we need to make sure this is as scott said distinct from velociraptor 
And to that end, I would say, why put it in the game at all? Because it's... Hey, did you design this? Do you watch our videos? <laughs> because why put Deinonychus in the game? It, it serves no purpose. The Velociraptor in, in Jurassic Park is Deinonychus. They find it in Montana. And the inclusion of this implies that there's a weird new Velociraptor in Montana that just, for whatever reason, exists. It's a better universe to live in where, for whatever reason, in the Jurassic Park universe, Deinonychus just got sunk into Velociraptor. And that's okay. And if you wanted to include another Dromaeosaur in the base game, there are any number of other things that you could have put in. And even leaving them featherless and, and maybe even going a little bit wild with them, it would have been a better choice. Like The, the existence of this is an affront, to, an affront to my good senses. I give this an F. All right. So with that rousing performance, uh, I've also, I have elected to make fiendish Dr. Wu tier gray. <laughs> That's good. Everything else is nice, bright, and colorful. This is gray. <laughs> um, so in the light of that rousing performance, we are going to put Deinonychus right where it deserves to be. In F, fiendish Doctor Wu. And Liam Neeson's the Gray. <laughs> Liam Neeson's the Gray. What a Jeez. terrible, terrible design! It's a bad design, but you know what's not terrible? The exceptional uh, comedy film Black Dynamite, from which we are deriving <laughs> this joke that I strongly recommend everyone checks out because it's a great. It is. It uh, is. I will warn you, best experienced when you're in your underwear uh, in bed. With Alex Rubenstahl in a hotel in Edmonton, Canada. We watched um, it. We it was have a table, so... so we had to watch it on the same bed. <laughs> and it was a heat wave, and the air conditioner broke in the, in the entire hotel. And so we were in our underwear, just desperately trying not to overheat it. Because like, we were also on one of the highest floors, so all the heat was rising. <laughs> to pass the time, we were like, I I'm... I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to show uh, James some classic, some classic comedies, some funny films. And we watched uh, uh, The Naked Gun first, which is very funny. Oh, but then we watched that, Black yeah. Dynamite, which is <laughs> one of the best movies ever made. <laughs> Check it it's out. A, You'll love it. It's an incredibly special film. I just, I remember when you guys went on that trip, because for the next month straight, there was not a single word out of your mouths that was not a quote <laughs> from that movie. Because I think you so tightly written. I don't think yeah. you had even watched it only once. I swear you guys had watched it, or at least- I've seen it. No, I mean, in that time frame. I think, like, independently then, you had seen it more than once. We have only together once, but- we, yeah. we might have. Yeah, we might have watched it twice. I, has Kalani seen it? No, I don't believe so, and I I will no. fix that. Oh yeah. Movie. Well, okay. Normally, this is where we would spin, spin that, that wheel. wheel, but given that oh no, I realized that our our dude is on here. Oh no, you've spoiled it. Well, in editing, you can remove him, and I can. and nobody will know where we're indicating. Casmosaurus will go in a video we already recorded that will come out. At, we're all messed up. We're doing three three straight weeks. We've recorded in opposite order of when they're going to come out. <laughs> and it is going to be terrible for our editors. Um, anyway, guys, this is normally where we'd spin the wheel. But next week, you'll hear us talk about Casmosaurus. A Back video to our regularly sure, scheduled programming. Yeah, yeah a video just as well as this one. I'm sure will be equally riveting. Um, Why don't you get more viewers? I would Just kill myself. It short. <laughs> it's not really short. It's an hour versus two and a half. Um, this video is also longer than Jurassic World Dominion. Um, I it's think more entertaining. It, it's a better movie. Now is when I thank the patrons. All of your names are on the screen in credits right now. But I also want to give verbal shout outs to Benjamin Seepser, nickname 3110, Philip Fico. Andrew Niddle, Christopher Bellis Jones, Adam Olos, Dan O'Kyrus, King Zashu, Max Ironpaw, 
original username, Pythonic, Swamp Ape Science, and we. Thank you all so much for your support of the Skeleton Crew. Please, all of you who've made it to the end of the video, remember to like this video and comment on it and subscribe to the Skeleton Crew if you haven't already. Um, we really appreciate anything you can do. Any little interaction you do with this video is going to make sure that more people see it and we can continue growing the ranks of the Skeleton Crew army that we will use to one day overthrow Frontier uh, Frontier Studios or whatever the this game company is called and put a proper Deinonychus model into Jurassic World Evolution 3. Here, here. Our numbers are become Legion. Also, if you join the Patreon, you'll get to be in the Discord and it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's rad. And well, before we close out, on that note of, of our numbers, this is the one year anniversary. We have gone from zero to at this point, we're probably closing in on 7,000 because this is two weeks from now. Um, spoiler. Uh, we are currently sitting at about 6,700 subscribers, and the fact that we did that, you guys did that in, like, a year is unbelievable. Yeah. we. I don't think any of us really know what to do with how quickly we're growing, and surely it's not causing <laughs> catastrophic damage to our mental health that will be emergent years later in our professional lives. Uh, <laughs> but in a, in a very serious... On a very serious note, I cannot thank all of you guys enough i i just the the level of support and engagement that you guys give us with these videos is really I, what i find gives us the motivation to keep making them right like it you guys love what we do and that means a lot to us and that makes us want to keep doing it and all of the little support you give us watching the videos engaging with them supporting us on patreon if you can really helps us make sure that we have the ability to keep making them for you guys and you know, I think at some point we might do a, a a year retrospective. Unfortunately, we're all really busy traveling right before the holidays and through the holidays, so we don't have time to kind of sit down and do that. Um, but we've got a lot planned that I think is going to make year two of the Skeleton Crew even more mm -hmm. exciting than year one. And so all of you guys should stick around. Um, I'm really excited for you guys to see what we have in store. So thank you so much. And we are going to close out this video because we're all so tired. You know, just I'm just pointing out. Yes. That usually, on a birthday or anniversary, it's someone who gets you a present, and we just kind of give you guys a present. So I. It's a good point. That's just how we operate. We did. Pay me. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's how the crew do. We give you a absolutely. Present. We are, we are generous. <laughs> we, kind and benevolent gods. <laughs>